what we're going to do today is to look into research theory and try to understand what a research framework is. We'll also try to differentiate between a theoretical and a conceptual framework. Um, you are welcome to today's session. And I'm hoping that by the time I finish this very confusing subject or topic in research, will be well understood by everybody. I'll take my time and teach. So when I'm teaching and using examples, kindly let me know when you have any question. Can I just post it in the chat room? I will just switch over and then answer your question. Um, so let's try, try to be attentive. I also advise that after I've taught you this, try as much as possible to read it from the book too and watch the video again. Being the, the reason being the fact that um, it's quite a very interesting topic. And sometimes um, it's not every student who's able to understand it as a given when we first teach it. So it takes some time for you to appreciate it. Especially if you have not been doing any research with theories before, this may be the first time that you may be hearing the word a theory or what a theoretical framework is. So that's what I'll do, to, I'll do today. I'll try to cover a research framework and then research theories and conceptual framework. Okay. So I'll explain the role of theories in the research process and try to introduce you to some of the different theories that are relevant for your type of research. we we'll start by looking at defining a research framework, exploring the different types of research framework, coming to understand the building blocks of a theory, examples of a theory, and then we'll round up with a level of a theory. We are now on chapter five of our book, and I will encourage you to try to read it as much as, as possible. There's a, an examination question on the theories part of the research. So I'm just advising you ahead of time that um, I think in the next few weeks we'll give you your exam questions, which is a take home exam. So I'll advise you to start and make sure you read this chapter and understand it very well. And the quiz associated to this to guide you to prepare for the exam has already been uploaded. Some of the questions that are part of what will come in the exam. So when you are practicing, when you are answering it, try to answer it well so that you can prepare yourself to the exam. Okay, so defining a research framework. Defining a research framework. Okay, so the research framework consists of two words, research and framework. So a framework is the frame for the research, <laughs> or it gives you um, the limits of the research. Kind of what you say is that you have, you have a frame for, um, for, for baking cake, and you also a square frame. That means that you will, you are aim, aiming to bake a square or a rectangular or, or a kind of a, a four-sided cake. So if you say your research framework is this particular set of uh, variables, that means that your research is going to be exploring those type of variables. So a research framework presents the way of studying variables or concepts concerning a phenomenon in order to find or investigate the solution for the research problem. When we learned about research problem, we realized that we end up defining gaps. And in the gaps of the research, it lets us to do, define our research purpose. And last week, we also learned that the research purpose goes to your research objectives and questions. So to be able to operationalize the activity of carrying out a study to collect data, to answer the research objectives or questions, you need to have a research framework. And what a research framework will do is that it tells you that among all the variables that concerning this particular phenomenon, which of them are you willing to study? Or which of them are you willing to explore or delve into? So the research framework presents a way of studying the variables and concepts concerning the, the phenomenon in order to investigate the solution for the research problem. So let me just give an example, a very basic example. And I'm using this basic example because I want you to get a fundamental premise of what the research framework does. So um, supposing you want to buy a piece of land and the land, you, land are usually supposed to be in a rectangular shape. So they tell you that the land is 100 by 70. And that piece of land is 100 by 70. When you multiply the 100 by 70, you are getting an idea of the area of the land. 
But how did you get to the area of the land? So the area of the land is what you want to know. Because you want to know, want to know that you establish that there should be a way that, or a frame for which we can, or a guide for you to be able to determine the area of a piece of land, which tends to be rectangular. And from, from um, science, you know that to be able to find an area of a rectangular object, you multiply the length and the breadth. So that particular fact, or we call it empirically verified um, relationship, which is called a theory. Listen carefully. Empirically ver verified relationship, which is called a theory, then guides you to be able to find the area of the land. So that theorem that says that the L times B will give you area of a rectangular object is placed upon the land and you get your L times B. So your 70 by 100 gives you how many square meters your land takes, um, 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 the, the area of the, of the piece of land that you are buying. I hope you understand me. Now, I will get into the uh, dynamics of the fact that the land is not always rectangular perfectly. When you are going, you see a tree here, you have to go around the tree. Okay, so theoretically, the space that you are assigned to is 70 by 100. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. The only way you are able to arrive at the, the, the particular area of that particular land is because you are, there is an existing frame for multiply, for understanding the area of a land, that, uh, of a rectangular object, that is L times B. So in your research endeavor of finding the area of a piece of land, you ended up using an existing theorem or fact which has been verified empirically to be able to guide you. So your frame then tells you that when you multiply L times B, you get the area of the land. So then your research framework, which is inspired by the theorem which exists already, the theory that exists already, is what gives you the area of the land. So when I want the area of my piece of land, I draw on an existing frame. And that existing frame, which has been empirically verified, is a theory. And that one guides me. So if I ask me, what is my research framework for finding the area of this land? I say, oh, it is this guy's theory that explains that L times B. So that I multiply the L times my B, and I'll get the area of my land. OK. So it, now the research framework is not doing L times B just like that. It's actually telling you the relationship between the concepts in a manner that can predict the social phenomenon. So supposing your land was going to be triangular shape, you can't use L times B. You may have to then use what half base times height. I hope you understand what, what I'm trying to say. In supposing your, your piece of land was um, is even in a trapezoid manner, you have to do different formally to be able to arrive at the area of the land. What I'm just trying to emphasize here is the fact that when you have a research problem and you are and have your research purpose or have your research objectives or questions to undertake a piece of research work, you need to find a way you are going to understand the phenomenon. And you have to, at most of the time, draw from existing frameworks that may guide you. That may guide you. And that existing framework is what we call that your research framework. Okay. Now I will then get into the what, how we generate the research framework. Then you can understand where we where we come from. Okay. Do you all understand this? Okay. Then. Thank you very much. Please, if you have any question, you can put it in the chat room. So, it is called a framework because it frames the research, defining the limits of the research. How far you go into asking the questions on variables. So if my research framework is having three, two variables, L times B, why will I spend my time trying to look for radius? The radius of the, of the land. There's nothing to do with the radius of land. I will end up choosing, um, guide, my research will be guided by the variables outlined in the frame, outlined in the frame. So my variable is L, which is length times the breadth or well, the width, which is, which will be my B or W. So in that case, I will not go out looking for things which are not in the frame. That is why we say that the research framework frames the research. Okay. Now, when you are doing a long essay, a long essay, your research framework is supposed to be an outcome or part of the discussions in the literature review. So I told you earlier that when you are doing your long essay, the literature review explains the concepts that you are going to use. After you have explained the concepts, it is important to go ahead 
and illustrate the research framework that you want to be able to use. So that is why we say the research framework forms part of the, the, the literature review of your long essay. However, if you are doing an M for a PhD, the research framework will be a whole chapter on its own because your level of depth, your depth of theorization, of understanding and explaining theories is expected to be higher than that person who is doing an MBA program. So there are two differences. We, Because your contribution to theory is much more, um, um, is, is, it has a higher focus in an M4 or a research type degree than an MBA. MBA is more about contribution, um, practice, um, the contribution to practice and how you can apply the framework to industry problems. So, I mentioned it earlier, that if you are doing a, if you are doing a, 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 a PhD, you have theoretical foundation research framework chapter. So that'll be on chapter three. That's what I was trying to explain. Okay, so now let's continue. So let's look at the example. I gave you this paper some time ago to read on mobiles and micro trading, which is part of the papers outlined in the, I think in our resources. So the question that the objective of the study was to explore the impact of mobile phones on micro trading activities on market traders. Out of that, three questions were derived. So they were, how do market traders use mobiles? What benefits do market traders obtain from mobiles? What is the impact or the benefits of using mobiles in micro trading activities of market traders? Now, in this scenario, you realize that if he wants a framework to be able to understand this one, he needs to establish one, how market to men use a mobile phone. Number two, an understanding of how benefits, what type of potential benefits would they gain from using mobile phones in business? And number three, what type of, type of impact? Okay. So if you go and read the literature review of the work, the, the literature review of the work tried to explain that, okay, one, what are the activities that market traders take place, um, that takes place in the market? There's pre-trade activities, during trade activities, and post-trade. So we need to understand how mobile phones are used in these three dimensions. That would be the first, first one. That's from economics. Number two, what, do, how do, what benefits do you get from mobiles? So in the same literature, you, from the transaction cost per perspective, there was a discussion on how mobile phone um, technology and its impact on trade. And it, told, it mentioned that the benefits of technology to trade are in three, or commerce, are in three dimensions. There's the operational benefits, relational or informational benefits, and then the strategic benefits. So that one will address number two. The third part, the same literature says that, you can read the paper later, the same literature is in Emerald. The same literature says that the impact of mobiles or micro trading activities on the traders. They say that mobiles have got three types of impact according to the literature. One, incremental impact. Last week we talked about this, incremental impact. Then there was another one had to do with um, um, transformational impact. And the last one had to do with production impact. So all these are coming from literature. When you put them together, this is what then you can get. So he's saying that traders take mobile phone is conceptualizing. And then the mobile phone will be applied in three, possible three areas pre-trade activities, during trade activities, and post-trade activities. That can generate certain benefits, strategic benefits, relational benefits, and operational benefits. That can lead to three types of impact, incremental effects, transformation effects, and production effects. Now, this is the research framework of the study. But listen carefully, look at what, the, what I've written here. Conceptual framework of the impact of mobile phones on micro trading. Now, it is saying conceptual framework because this one is coming from a conceptualization from different theories and different discussions in the literature that the person has put together. When he went into the literature, he didn't find one particular theory that can explain everything. So he ended up looking at the literature and drawing from the different aspects of literature to come up with this particular framework. So he's now saying that this is my conceptualization of how mobile phones impact micro trading. And looking at my research questions, if I apply this one, 
which is based on the literature discussion and, and the transaction cost theory, I can be able to address my research issues or my research questions. So now my frame for redoing the research has been inspired by looking at different issues in the literature that gives me an understanding of how women make market women trade, what benefits they gain, and then what impact. I need to go to the, in, to the field and test and explore or check whether what my conceptualization that I've done here is possible or is true or reflects what is in industry. So by the time he finishes, he can then go and refine this particular framework. So you can realize that he has drawn from what is existing from the literature. And if you go into the literature and read the paper, you can see all these discussions being done. Thank you. We'll come back to it. So I, so I was just trying to emphasize here that when you have a research frame, what does it do? It tells you the limits of the frame, the, the, the limits of the question, the, uh, the type, outline the questions, the, the variables that you are going to study in your research work and tells you what data, you, informs the data you are going to collect, informs you on the data you are going to collect. Okay. So now it is important that we understand the different types of research frameworks so that we can be inspired and have a better perspective of what we're able to use it for. Now, to be able to look at the different types of research framework, which are, I'm going to explain the types of research framework based on how they are formulated. Based on how they are formulated. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. And I realized I have to even add some more information. Okay. So let's go ahead. Other information will come up. Other information will come up. Okay. Good. So when you are doing your long essay, you need to develop a research framework. This is the two types of approaches to develop a research framework. First of all, some students are researching on an area in which an ex there are very good theorization in the area. So there's existing theory. I remember I told you that a fact that had been empirically verified. I'll give you the, the, the more, a, um, a kind of a, a detailed definition later, but I'm just use the theory as a, a fact that has been empirically verified over time. So the theory then guides you to do your research. So somebody can take a theory and apply it to his work. So he end up modifying the theory or adding other things to it, then he'll use it to his, do his work. Now, as soon as you pick your theory and I, you add it to, you apply it to your work, and you modify it a little bit, or you even adapt it to your work. Once you adapt it to your work, you, you end up explaining the theory in relation to your work. Now you have come to a conceptual level that you are saying that this thing I'm studying, I can study it based on this theory. So now this is my conceptualization of how I'm going to address the issue. There are other authors or students who may be carrying out a research that one theory cannot satisfy what you are trying to study, or there is no good one theory that can even does everything comprehensively. So he needs to be able, listen carefully, to read the different literature and come out with his own framework, like you just saw me do. So in that case, he will develop a conceptual framework based on, listen, based on what? Based on the literature he has read, which will be a combination of theories and other literature that he has read. So he starts from that, he can either start from a theory and modify it and come here, and then or go from and, and go and go straight to literature review and come here. So what you realize is that at the end of the day, every research framework that you are going to be using is going to be at the cost, listen carefully, listen carefully, listen carefully. You see, whenever you go to the field and you are collecting data, you have left the abstract world, that's the theoretical world, and you have come to the level of the real world. In the real world, you need to conceptualize something to apply there. So your conceptualization may be based on a theory or based on the literature review. But as soon as you get to the field, you are going to operationalize the actual things you want to study. So you are now suggesting that this thing that I'm studying, this is how it may work, may relate together. So we say that most of the time, or even all the time, your research framework is a conceptualization of how you think the problem you are facing is going to be solved. That is one of the reasons why that when you see people present a research framework, they originally write by the side, conceptual model or conceptual framework for the study. It is still the research framework. You see, the word is research framework. It can be it's conceptualized either from the theory or from the literature review or a combination of the literature review 
and get jewelry. Hmm. I hope you get it. I don't know where you got it, whether you got it. Okay, so let me use an example. Last week, we looked at a paper that was talking about online relationship marketing and customer loyalty, a signaling theory perspective. Okay. Now, when we, ah, okay, yes, we looked at that. I remember we looked at that. Good. Now, when you look at that particular paper, the paper was trying to look at how online relationship activities actually impact on customer loyalty. And if the, rich, the research problem emphasized that there is less theorization in the area. So the, the student or the author tried to use what we call the signaling theory perspective to address it. So now I'm going to show you the model the person developed. So let me just, I'll answer your question. Oh. Let me just jump to, the, to that and let's continue. Okay. So. Okay, Richard. Hey, Richard, welcome. Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you. Now, this is the paper that was written. So we have it here. Online relationship marketing and customer larger signaling theory perspective. So if you scroll down, look at the literature review. He starts by discussing the online relationship marketing. So that one has been discussed and explained. Then he goes on to discuss signaling theory. So he's now explaining the theory. And the online relationship marketing, he talked about the different types of um, um, activities that may be in online that, uh, relationship marketing, that's engagement, interactivity, advocacy, personalization, and collaboration. Okay, so similarly to what he's explaining, it's explained here in relation to online relationship marketing activities. Then he talks about customer loyalty. Then he discusses one of the, two of the uh, relationship marketing activities that I talked about, engagement, and then interactivity. So hypotheses are developed. Okay. Hypothesis just tells us the relationship between two variables. So engagement will positively affect interactivity. Engagement positively affects online trust. Engagement positively affects customer loyalty. Then it goes to interactivity. Interactivity positively affects online trust. Interactivity positively, positively affects customer loyalty. Okay. Then he goes again, online trust. Online trust positively affects customer loyalty. So H6. H7, interactivity mediates the relationship between engagement and online trust. Interactivity which mediates the relationship between, that comes in between, the relationship between engagement and customer loyalty. Last one, online trust mediates the relationship between engagement and customer loyalty, customer loyalty. And then interactivity, interactivity mediates the relationship between interactivity and customer loyalty. And this one is wrong. Supposed to be engagement and customer loyalty. Okay. So now let's um, look at the method. So look at the, the model. You see, you see, written conceptual model here, and he's going to say that this the conceptual model for the study is and hypothesis relationship are elaborate, elaborated above. Engagement goes to customer loyalty. That was what we mentioned. Engagement goes to interactivity. Good. Engage interactivity goes to Customer loyalty. Cost interactivity also goes to customer loyalty, but through online trust. Do you see that? Then engagement goes to, uh, to customer loyalty through online trust. Then engagement can also go to customer loyalty, but through interactivity, the last one here. So now these are the hypothesized relationships that the person is going to test. There are about eight of them. In fact, nine, in about 10 of them. I think this is two. It's, it's actually H. 8B, so that's about nine, well, nine of them, I think so, yeah. So if you look at it carefully, so this hypothesis tells the relationship, but it is based on a literature review, you saw that literature review, and the signaling theory discussions. So this is now the research framework of the study, but which is also the conceptual model. We call it conceptual model because you are now at the concept or relationship stage, but it's still your research framework because it's framing your research. So when you go to the field, we expect the questions on the, in, in the study to be based on these particular variables and their relationship. So if you look at it, these are the, uh, some of the questions that were asked in the field. Engagement, look at the questions. I interactivity, these are the questions. Online trust, these are the questions. What, what's the quantitative? You have to weigh them, weight them, and then look at which of them are significant in terms of the analysis. The customer loyalty, these are the questions. So all the variables are there, engagement, interactivity, online trust, customer loyalty. 
So if you don't have a research framework or a conceptual model, you can't actually, listen carefully, have your research um, questionnaire well inspired by the literature. You can't have it well inspired. Now, I'm not saying that every research has a research framework, but at the MBA level, we expect you to have some level of a framework to guide you in your study. Otherwise, why, where do you have your limits of your questioning? Your questioning is going to be based on certain variables. There are some type of studies that people just have one question and they don't have any <coughs> um, certain variable, um, any defined variable. They just go and just go and explore. That's quite different. When we are talking about you trying to study a phenomenon in business, and then before you can say that phenomenon in business, we expect you to define the research variable that may be important to look at or explore within that particular phenomenon. And this and tell us the relationship between the phenomenon. So now he goes to the field with this particular conceptual model, which is also his research framework. The research framework is that what is framing your research. That's all. But the label conceptual model tells you that he has now left the theory state to come to the conceptual state. So I am conceptualizing that this is how it will work. I'm conceptualizing. If you look at what he says, that the study adopts a quantitative approach using a survey technique to test the research hypothesis presented above. So this is the relationship is going to test it. So if you finish testing it, you may end up have a post-study framework. So look at it. The results of the structural model, which tells you the ones which are significant, the relationships which are very, very significant. So you can see and the, the, the degree of significance that they have. So you see that the ones which are very highly uh, significant, you can see that there are three stars there. You can see that one there. Okay. So, and then it tells you about all the relationships. And now you can see that there the, the are also, the part descriptions are also defined here. And the ones for the mediation too are also discussed here. And the discussion goes and concludes. Okay, so what I was just trying to show you is an example of somebody doing this work. Now let's go back to, um, let me see if I can find, good. Now look at this study too. This is the conceptual framework that, or the research framework that guided the author to go and do the research. So if you look at it, he says here, in summary, the regard, regarding micro trading activities, traders may use mobile phones in pre-trade and during trade and post-trade activities. This application of the mobile phones in trade may generate operational relation and generate a strategic benefit, which may have an incremental transformation and production effect in the micro trading activities. Figure one illustrates the summary in the conceptual framework. So your conceptual framework or your research framework, even it's a summary of your discussion of the relationship that can exist between variables. It's a summary. So the summary is presented here. Now, look at what you have here. When you finish the study, the post-study framework, what you found out, you can see this is the post-study framework. Now, when I went to the field, now look at it, because he left, listen carefully, now he was in the conceptual model, conceptual state. Now he has come to the real state in Ghana. Study this. Now he said that the impact of mobile phones or micro trading activities in Ghana, this is what I found. I didn't find anything for production, so production fell out. But I found transformation and in, in incremental effects. I found some strategic benefits. I found relational benefits. I found operational. Then I, go, I realized what happens in pre-trade, during trade, and post-trade. Initially, all these parts were empty, if you remember. All these parts were empty. It's the research that was able to generate this. The research gave the findings that generated and inspired the final model. Inspired the final model. Okay. So let's go back. I'm going to answer your question, but let's go back to our study. So you can either pick a research theory, modify it and use it in your work. I'll show that later. Or you can pick a research conceptual framework and then modify, um, um, read from the literature and then generate this. So now let's look at how then let's look at the first approach, a theory that you end up modifying to use. And then well, I've just showed you the one that can pick conceptual framework from here. Okay, so let me look at my, the question for my, my great friends who are here. Okay. <coughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I'm in air conditioning. I'm drinking some water too. Corona cannot happen to me. Amen. And number two, it will not pass through the, it will not pass through our uh, Zoom and come to you. 
<laughs> Katis, thank you very much. And Jere, thank you. Okay, so Rachel, are we on page so that we can continue? <coughs> okay. Philip, thank you. Okay, so a, what is a theory? I mentioned earlier a theory is a factor has been empirically verified over time. But what does it really mean? So we are trying to say a theory is a coherent, coherent. Coherence means that they come together to make sense. They come together to, explain, to, to establish a meaning. They come together to establish a meaning. A coherent set of what? General propositions, general hypotheses, general uh, postulations of relationships. Yeah, I'm using a lot of <laughs> technical terms. General um, conjectures of relationships used as principles of explanation. A theory should have its purpose. A theory is used as principles of explanation, understanding and predicting mm, apparent relationship. What is apparent in certain observed phenomena? So let's take it, uh, let's take our time. What we mean is that when you have a theory, it should have been built out of an observed phenomenon. So a theory explain phenomena. That is the first thing you should have on your mind. A theory explains phenomena or helps us to understand phenomena or helps us to predict phenomena. But that phenomena should have been observed empirically over time so that a theory can be de derived. Oh God, I'm teaching well. What I'm trying to say is that you cannot have a theory without observing a phenomena, observing society, observing data. So when you observe data, after some time, you establish a principle of how something occurs, or you establish a principle and an understanding of how something occurs. Then based on that understanding, we get the theory. So your theory is a coherent set of general propositions. So it means that there are relationships that occurs in a phenomenon, and they come together to establish a meaning. But somebody has taken time to study that thing over time, observe that thing over time, and empirically test it over time so that we can call it a theory. Sorry if I'm shouting, please. So a theory is a coherent set of general propositions. It also means that at the end of the day, a theory will tell us relationship that exists between certain things. Because propositions is a propo proposal, like a uh, I'm proposing that these are the relationships that exist between the two, um, or I'm conjecturing that these are the two, these two things work like this. So when we say that we want the area of a rectangle for your piece of land, we are saying that you need to take something called the length, which is the longer side, and something called the breadth, which is the shorter side, and then multiply it. We didn't say square it. So there is a relationship that established meaning. We didn't say square it. We didn't say divide it. We say multiply. Take this one and multiply it. So multiply itself is a relationship. Multiply of a type of relationship that is coming together. So multiply it together and you need to generate the area. So I have done this over time and I realized that when you multiply the L times the B, you will end up getting the area. So I can then use this particular area of a triangle as my principle of understanding, principle of determining and predicting the area of a theoretical area of a piece of land. What I mean by theoretical areas is that we can go to the land and then somebody has built a wall <laughs> in between part of your land. So then the, the actual accessible land may be less than the theoretical area. I'm just giving you an idea why. So 70 by 100 will give you the theoretical area. But on the real land, certain things can happen. Okay. Okay, so now we have an idea of what a theory is. So a theory has been empirically tested and verified and can be shown good. Theories can be shown in three ways. One, as a normal description of a text. There's no diagram. Number two, as a schematic diagram. Number three, as a mathematical equation. So don't expect all theories to be a diagram. Neither should you expect all theories to be a mathematical equation. So you could have a, a mathematical model. You can have a theory that is not a model, a mathematical model. That is not a schematic diagram or visualized diagram. That can be just text that I explained. Okay. Rachel, I don't know which part you don't understand because. Oh, oh you, are, you are responding to Anne. <laughs> okay. Good. 
So, <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. So, a theory is going to be expressed in this way. <coughs> what is happening to my throat today? <clears throat> Don't worry. Okay, so let's continue. <clears throat> so, the research framework can be theoretically inspired that you can take a theory and modify it. Now, this is from this picture. You can see the, our lady trying to look at what is happening. <laughs> Some students are asking her, well, what is happening. You are just looking like the lady standing here. Okay, so this beautiful lady is saying that, what is this? This is what we call the theory of plant behavior, developed by Ajahn in 1985. Ajahn says, listen very carefully, Ajahn says the research, the, the theory of plant behavior tells us what influences or predicts a, a plant behavior, a behavior that is made by usually choice. So, so he said there are three things that influences a person's planned behavior, intended behavior. One, for an intention to occur, a person has to, it can generate from a person's attitude towards the behavior. Number two, attitude, attitude is defined as the degree to which you have a favorable consideration towards the behavior. Okay, so let me take my time. You are assessing somebody why a person, people go to shop in a crown mall. Now, the first variable can be attitude because they have a favorable consideration that when they go to a crown mall, they will have everything they are looking for. So a crown mall is in his mind, defined as a place that brings almost all multiple shop, shops that is able to give him all the different things that he wants to buy from provisions to vegetables and then to electronics. And even sometimes they even sell cars there. So he has a, a very good and even there are some duty free, there are some duty shops that, that sell perfumes and all kinds of stuff. So everything that he's looking for, he can get in a car mall. So he develops a favorable consideration that informs his attitude towards the intention to go perform the behavior. Intention is not performing the behavior. Intention that says that in, if I want to buy, um, let's say, cake, I can go to a car mall. If I want to, want to go to Centopia to buy perfume, by let's say uh, uh, Prada, I can go to the uh, um, the uh, uh, Centopia in Accra Mall. If I want to buy cloth, I can go and buy wooden or Blisco from Accra Mall. So that gives him a favorable consideration about going to Accra Mall. Then he has got another set of variables called the subjective norm. Subjective norm says that. Even though you have a good attitude about it, there are some certain times that certain norms in society can influence you. Norms can put pressure on you to go and perform the behavior or can inform your intention. Norms can be either peer influence or society influence or even industry influence. So let me give an example. Somebody can be influenced by peers. Friends are going to the mall. It's a holiday. Oh, no, it's not been a holiday. Friends are going to the mall. So you intend to go to the mall because your friends are going there. So peers are influencing you. It could also be from society. Today is six March. Everybody is finding a place to have fun. So most people go towards uh, 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 the, where people can be found. So society itself is going to a car mall. So you join society. Or even in an office environment, we have been able to come up with a good deal of maybe financial break, um, um, uh, financial, we have signed on a new client that is bringing us a million dollars and we are happy, we want to celebrate. So we're going to a car mall to go and have fun or even have lunch together. So the office itself can put pressure on you or influence your intention to go to the mall. So you have the attitude and you have got a subjective norm. Then the two of them come together to influence your intention. However, I can realize that let me just point something. This two uh, was formed by somebody who also said that there's something called the theory of reason action. These two things inform the action for people. But I can argue that later that those two are not enough. When you go to the mall, there are certain situational impediments that can influence a person to either go to the mall or can even influence how the person enjoys being in the mall, how long he stays in the mall. So it can influence the actual performance of the behavior. So supposing you go to the mall, your friends are going there, you join them to go. And then you have only 100 CDs in your pocket. And they go and sit at, um, let's say, 
basalos. Basalos, chicken, and, and jollof cost uh, the whole meal plus salad cost 42 cities. Now, if you get a quarter chicken and then 42 cities, that is one plate for you. You went to three friends, your girlfriend and her two roommates. Now, 42 times three, including you, the money will not be enough. So you may able to buy two plates. Maybe you buy the bigger meal for them. Then if they ask you to eat, you say, oh, you ate banku before coming because you are okay. So you don't want to eat some. What is constraining your performance of the behavior of the eating itself is your income. So Ajahn was saying that there are individual situational impediments which can constrain a performance of a behavior or limit it or influence it. So even though you intend to go there, that individual situational impediments can prevent you from actually performing the behavior for a long time or even performing the behavior at all. So his arrow comes from not just intention, but can actually influence the actual performance of the behavior. How long you stay in a cram or eating will depend on what is in your pocket. Or you always be nice and say that, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's about you. And you enter your, your girlfriend and say, oh, it's all about you, I'm serving you. You're not telling the truth. There's nothing in the pocket or the pocket is not good enough to be able to enjoy them. Now, the reason why some of you are happy about what I'm saying is that, and you say that, oh, it's interesting, I mean, we can see what he's, we can understand what he's saying. But technically, what I'm doing is that I picked a theory, and theories exist in the abstract world, and I've applied it to a situation like going to the crown mall, and you can understand it. That's how theories are. Theories exist at the abstract world. The abstract world is about behavior. So some authors have used this particular theory to understand why people choose certain products. They have used to also understand even banking products, even hospital behavior, why some customers and some clients and some patients like this doctor over that doctor. There are a lot of things that this one can even explain, but it's all about planned behavior. Any intended behavior can be examined by using the theory of planned behavior. Okay, so now let me, let me then go and show, take your questions. Oh, wow, 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 wow. I need, <laughs> Richard, <laughs> I'm not bringing cold, I'm bringing just warm, warm water. Thank you very much. Okay, so now you should slow down. <laughs> Can the price of the goods be sold there? What's the meaning of subjective norm? Oh, no, no, prices are not in the subjective norm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Nigeria, thank you very much. So, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that your ability to enjoy being at the mall with your girlfriend and her roommates is depends on what is in your pocket. And you see, because the boy is also being assessed by the girl about how friendly and generous he is. He's also trying to keep up appearances. And that is what then comes to become a problem. But we see that the attitude, the subjective non the perceived behavior control can constrain, um, can inform the intention and can constrain the performance of the behavior. That is the theory of plan behavior. Now, the theory of plan behavior was built out of the theory of reason action, which is actually a mathematical equation illustrated here that says that Behavioral intention is a function of a person's attitude towards the performing the behavior and then a person's subjective norm. But the agent went further to then break it down and add the perceived behavioral control. Okay, so now let me then show you um, a conceptual, the conceptual approach to it. So I thought I can take a theory and use it for your research. But let me go to actual paper because I don't want to use such a thing. So let's go for a paper that have used the theory of plan behavior and see how the person use the child plan behavior. Okay, so what we'll do now is to just go and pick a paper that has used the child plan behavior. Now this is a paper that is called Using the child plan behavior, plan behavior to understand brand love. Brand love is perceived as one of the main objectives in brand, in brand management. Nevertheless, research in the factors influencing brand love are scarce. The paper applies aims to apply the theory of plan behavior. You see, aim to apply. Remember what we said. Theories are used as principles of what? Explanation, predicting, and understanding social phenomena. So the paper aims to apply the theory of plan behavior to the context of brand love and investigate. So all theories should seek to explain what? A phenomenon. He is using the theory of plan behavior to explain the phenomenon of intent and planned love. 
brand love means that if you your love for a brand, which he thinks that it can be a planned activity, a planned concept, like a, it's a planned behavior, sorry, and investigate the, the, the influence of several factors on brand love, in, including attitude towards the brand, subjective norm, and perceived behavioral control. Can't you see it? Okay. So the person then goes on to discuss brand love and then discusses brand forgiveness. Then he talks about brand theory of plan behavior. Then integrates the theory of plan behavior to brand love. So he has to now leave the theoretical state to come to a conceptual state where he's linking the theory of brand, love, uh, brand behavior to the brand love concept. Then after that, he ended up coming to this one, this particular model. Now, he's saying that attitude and subjective norm will inform in brand love. That will also lead to an outcome called forgiveness, brand forgiveness. So if you love them, if you love the brand, you are more likely to forgive. So it's like you have intention here, then goes to the actual performance of the behavior. So the actual performance of the behavior forgiveness is informed by brand love. So then it's also informed by attitude and subjective norm. Now the perceived behavioral control, he broke it into two. Remember I mentioned income. So you can see affordability of the brand. Then propensity to anthropomorphize means that to treat the brand like a human being. Some people treat brands like a human being. They associate human uh, elements of love to the brand. That's why it's called propensity to anthropomorphize. Let me look for um, that particular explanation for those of you who are asking that what is this? Okay, so uh, anthropomorphism has emerged as a central factor for processes governing the human relations, governing human relationships to transfer to brands. According to um, Ipley, imbuing the real imagined behavior of your human agents with human-like characteristics, motivations, and intention and emotion is the essence of anthropomorphism. Guthrie argues that anthropomorphism is seeing the human in non-human forms and events that pervades judgment. Okay. So I want to see if you... Okay. So brand anthropomorphism strategies like introduction to a mascot or an endorser are likely to lead to consumer perception that the brand has a human-like characteristic, including motivations and then intention. I think you know about a mascot. Sometimes you see that maybe high, high sense is doing an, a, 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 a promotion. And then that electronic shop in front of it will have somebody dressed like a mascot standing here and dancing and stuff. So that it can draw you some, draw some love for you to the, showing that the product and you may wear, even this one has the same thing. If you know the bunny that is energizer bunny, energizer bunny. So you can see that the energizer is made like a rabbit. To, to draw in some, um, some human or uh, um, um, real life characteristics to the particular brand. Mm -hmm. So you humanize the brand. That's what he's trying to emphasize. Okay. So when he did that, he says that these two will also come to brand love and then they come to um, forgiveness. But he will say the level of in involvement may or a level of involvement with the brand can moderate the relationship between the predicted variables and then this particular one. So in, in quantitative met, um, uh, studies, this, these three here are your independent variables. And these ones are your dependent variables. And this one is your outcome. These, are, these two are your independent variables. But if you realize the more independent variable is forgiveness. This one is called a mediator because it sits in between your dependent variables and your independent variables. So the brand lab is a mediator here. Okay. So you have seen the research, proposed research model, which is also the proposed research framework, which is also your conceptualized model coming from or inspired by what the theory of plan behavior. Voila. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say here is that we had a theory of plan behavior and we wanted to apply it to the uh, uh, brand lab. So we took the theory of plan behavior and I put it on brand lab to study brand lab that leads to brand forgiveness. So I have brand love here being a mediator, the forgiveness being here, but I've got the attitude, subjective norm, and the PBC, that the propensity, the perceived behavior control, which I expanded to either co co contain the affordability and then propensity to anthropomorphize. 
these three things or four things come together to influence a person's man life. Do you realize that the only thing he didn't do in this evaluation is to look at how perceived behavior control can lead straight to forgiveness? He didn't explore that one. So sometimes when you state the models, you can tell the relationship that you want that can occur that you want to study. It's not all the relationship that you wanted to study. You wanted to study what will lead to brand love and lead to forgiveness. Okay. So do we have a better understanding now? What we said earlier was that we can pick our research model or our research framework can be inspired by a theory, which I just showed you, and to still be a conceptual model that you develop. But the theory is going to be inspired by, the, the research framework is going to be inspired by theory. So let me explain something to you. In your long essay, you have, if your supervisor asks you that what is your research framework, he's just asking that what theory or conceptual, uh, uh, what theory is informing your understanding or what set of concepts are you bringing together to inform the study? So in that sense, if you put them together, you have developed a conceptual model for the study, which is also your research framework, depending on what you want to call it. The research framework is just a frame for the research, which is a conceptual way of looking at your work. Good. But that ability to develop that conceptual model can be developed by out of theory or out of the literature. That's what I'm just trying to say. Okay. So let's go to the next one, which is conceptual. Now, somebody is studying um, factors that contribute to unemployment. So to be able to do the study on factors that contribute to unemployment, he comes up with four from the literature. We remember we read some literature some time ago. Political instability, lack, lack of startup, startup capital, high interest rates, and low wages. He is saying that these are the predicting factors of unemployment. So these independent factors can cause unemployment. So we call them a factor-based model. So the factors are pointing to the unemployment dimension outcome. So based on the literature review, the person developed this particular one. So it's still a conceptual model is going to test, but it's based on the literature he has read. <clears throat> now, I also mentioned that sometimes the research framework itself can also be based on the literature and then theory. So this person read on uh, research, uh, read on um, theory, plan, theory plan behavior and is now applying to the more. So he said knowledge about the more peer influence and income. And then he thinks that <coughs> the knowledge about the more can also <coughs> shape a person's um, intention. So knowledge about the more goes to trust or perceived value, then it can be goes to intention. So the intention to perform, to go to the more, is influence, can be mediated by the trust that person may have. And that one can also go to behavior. So now you can you see here that when you have knowledge, you can go from knowledge to intention to behavior, peer intention to behavior, income intention to behavior, income to behavior, or you can go to knowledge, trust, intention, and behavior. We call this one serial mediation. When you have a double mediation, one, two, so one, two, these are two mediations. One, two, one, two, and leading to this one. So knowledge, trust, and value to intention and behavior. So this can be somebody's conceptualization, but you can't just draw the arrows. It has to be based on literature that there are proven relationships between the two, between them. But maybe you are now studying it in this particular way. You may not find it for studying them all, but you may find the relationship that this exists between maybe buying a car or um, like brand love or um, doing um, doing a plan activity, making choosing between products or making a choice between a service. So, but all of this in, is informed by the relationship that exists here. Now, we are saying this is conceptual because still you are now, you have taken the theory and you have applied it to a, a, a situation you want to study. So now this is your conceptual model for your study, which also defines your research framework. So your research framework is inspired by theory or is inspired by theory and literature or inspired by literature alone. It can be only any of the three. A research framework can be inspired by theory or your conceptual framework can be inspired by theory, can be inspired by what? Literature, or can you inspire by theory and literature? So every research framework exists in a conceptual dimension because at the time you are going to the field and it is framing your research, you have now come to a conceptual, you have, you have now conceptualized that this is what will work here. Okay. So the concept you should know is a theory and then what? A conceptual model. Theory can inspire conceptual models. 
But conceptual models, when they are tested and verified for a very long time, they can become, become theories. See how the relationship is. Good. Now, when you carry out your study, you need to have a research framework, something that is framing your research, which becomes your conceptual model. That particular something that is framing your research is either inspired by theory or inspired by reading the literature or inspired by reading the literature and then theory. That's what we are trying to say. But because you are going to the field, we can call this research framework also a, what you call a theoretical, a, a, a conceptual model. Now, the reason why you see me putting conceptual here and the other one I put theory here is because I wanted to tell you that this is a research framework which was developed out of theory. This is a research framework. It was developed out of concepts from the literature. Just concept, concept, concept from the literature. Okay. So what's a conceptual framework? When you carry out research, your conceptual framework means as a, a, a framework of concepts, which you think can work, can explain a phenomenon. So the conceptual framework helps to simplify reality so that you can do, carry out your study. Simplify reality by selecting certain observed variables, either from theory or from literature, and suggesting relationships between them. So all conceptual frameworks are suggestions. And the suggestions are inspired by theory or inspired by reading the literature or both. You get so that. So all conceptual frameworks are inspired by theory or inspired by literature or inspired by both. Thank you very much. Now, what you see is that when you have a conceptual framework, you have defined your research framework. But sometimes some supervisors get confused. They say, oh, what is, they ask, what's your theoretical framework? They do ask, what's your conceptual framework? What's your, what's your research framework? The theoretical framework in this scenario is what theory is underpinning your thinking. That is one. So that is goal. Number two, what is your conceptual framework? What out of the theory you have, you have what conceptual conceptualization have you developed based on either the theory or the literature or both the theory and the literature? The last one is that now that you have it, where are you going with your research? Then you have a research framework. So your conceptual framework for your study is actually a research framework. That's all. Your conceptual framework for your study is actually, it's the final choice of what you're going to study, which is the frame for your research. So it's a research framework, which is belong, be developed out of your concepts that you have read from the literature, from the theory, or from both. Okay. So don't be confused about them. It is a terminology that faculty and other students just keep throwing away. So most of the time, you see that in the literature that we'll be reading, you see that the right proposed model, proposed conceptual framework, or conceptual framework. They, they don't, they, because at the end of the day, going to the field, look at something, going to the field is, depends on your conceptual framework. Now, listen carefully. We said a conceptual framework suggests relationship between things, suggests relationship. So we have to know in what ways that con do conceptual framework suggest the relationship? In what ways? What are the different ways in which relationships can be suggested? We also have to understand that it is a conceptual framework that one day, after it has been empirically tested over time, becomes a theory. Okay. Okay, so, Richard, what we are saying is that your research framework can either be inspired by theory or inspired by concepts from the literature or inspired by both the concept from the literature and theory. Do you understand it? Either way you do, when you say you are going to the field, you are calling the conceptual framework. Let me just show you an example, Rachel. Let me take my time to explain things to Rachel. Rachel has to understand it so that I will be free. Okay, so now listen to something. I started by discussing, in this paper, the person started by discussing theory of plan behavior. So look at it here. I don't want to. So look at conceptual. Did you see what well, is conceptual what background? Brown love is a concept. Brown forgiveness is a concept. Then the theory of plan behavior is an extension of what? The theory of reason action, also developed by Agen and Fishman 1980. So I told you Agen after 1991 came back with the theory of plan behavior. Now, so it is one of the most influential theories for explaining and predicting behavior, which comes from psychological theory. Okay, so I don't want to get into that. Now, if you look at it, he explained the theory of plan behavior. Then he said that, how can I integrate the theory of plan behavior to a concept called brand love? This is how you do your longest thing. You take the theory and integrate it to brand love. So now I'm integrating to, but when I began, I began by displaying the concept of brand love and brand forgiveness. Then after integrating it, I developed some hypothesis. It's not my paper, but I'm just using it there. 
Sabrina, the people, the author is called Sabrina. Sabrina developed some hypothesis and then he came up with this and said that, okay, the theory of plant behavior is for a relationship between certain variables and an intended behavior that will lead to an actual performance of behavior. What we want to study is how do people forgive brands? But before you can forgive brands, you have to have brand lands. What, in, what are the anticipations to the brand love? Attitude to the brand, subjective norm to the brand, and perceived behavioral control to the brand. So all this is, is embedded within the theory of plant behavior. But now we have left the theory of plant behavior and we have come to the real world and we are conceptualizing that how can theory of plant behavior help us to understand brand love and brand forgiveness. So when we apply it, we are now come to the conceptual level where we are conceptualizing relationship based on a theory. So now our research framework is saying that when you take the theory of brand behavior and you add it to the brand love concept, brand forgiveness concept, this is what you get, a conceptual model for studying brand love and brand forgiveness. Good. This conceptual model is inspired by their theory and a review of the concepts called brand love and brand forgiveness. Are we okay? So if you ask me, where is my theoretical base, brand theory of brand behavior? Where are my concepts I'm using? I'm using concepts of brand love and theory forgiveness. Where is my conceptual model? This is my conceptual model. Where is my, my frame, research framework? This is my research framework because it is a conceptualization of what will happen in the real world. So anytime anybody presents a conceptual framework, the next thing is going to methodology. So you see, after presenting a conceptual framework, what do you see? Look at it. The following research model is or research framework. It's a model and framework. We say the, the, the following research model is proposed, figure one. The model is tested with the help of online survey methodology. You see that. Anytime you present your research framework or your conceptual model, the next thing you are going to do is your methodology. You are going to the real world. So before you enter the real world, conceptualize. Tell us what you are going to do. How are you going to look at the variables? How are you going to look at the relationships? So, Rachel, our ability for us to enter the real world and collect data depends on our conceptualization of what the things we are studying. We are studying brand love. Our conceptualization is that brand love and brand forgiveness will care by this. But it is inspired by what? The theory of plant behavior. Inspired by the theory of plant behavior. So, when we say, where is good? A research framework is a guide before and after the work. No. Before the work is your guide. After the work, you confirm your post-study framework. That what is the outcome? So let's see. You see, look at what is wow. <laughs> so look at some of the things that came out of the study. The results of the overall model. Now look at what is breaking. Look at this one. So now brand love is uniqueness, pleasure, intimacy, and memories. And then he has got this one here too. Then he studied the moderating effect of what uh, involvement. How involvement can so when involvement came, this is now the the new um this has uh, measures of significance and measures of relationships between them. So it's not that the thing is significant at um, either P is greater than 0 0.015 or P is greater than 0 0.01. Okay. If you read it, you will explain it better to you. But all I'm just trying to emphasize here is that you can see what's happening here. So now I've got broken. The love then breaks down to uniqueness, pleasure, intimacy, and memories, and then goes to forgiveness. Okay. So then that becomes your posterior framework that people can use in the future. I want to see whether the questionnaire is here. Can you see the, the questionnaire is here? Good. So you, uniqueness, pleasure, intimacy, duration, all of these are part. Duration is involvement, I think so. That's brand love elements. Then theory of plan behavior, are 16 items. Attitude, subjective norm, propensity to uh, anthropomorphize, and then affordability. Leading to forgiveness and any involvement. Are we okay? Good. Good, 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 good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So, sorry, let's go back to our model here. So we now understand what we are trying to do. Um, Rachel um, and uh, Philip and Co. If you are in Co, I you, hope you are okay. Curtis, Habib, Habib too, and Foster. I hope you are all understanding faith. I hope you are catching up with what we are doing. Thank you very much. Okay. If you are getting it, let me know you are getting it. Yes, let me know you are getting it. Let's let me know you are getting it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Eric, 
I hope you are getting it. Mm. Abna, I hope you are getting it. Okay. Um, Kwesi and Kujo, all of you, Kujo, I hope you are all getting it. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. Imas, thank you very much. Okay. So let's continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. This video, I think you watch it again. And in case any supervisor is confusing, you can tell the supervisor to also watch the video. <laughs> okay, so conceptual framework. Now we need to understand how do people suggest the relationship. The first way is what we call the cause and effect relationship. And what this is the most simplest one. People read about independent factors and then dependent factor. Then they draw arrows to it. So we call it a factor-based model or a cause and effect model. So you see that happening here. Factor-based model. Factors coming to an, an outcome. This is the very simplest model you see. And you see it in many people's work. So a factor-based model. And you saw as an example of just what we saw with Sabrina's work. Factors just leading to an outcome. Factor-based model. Okay. So that's what it's cause and effect. Causes, these are the causes leading to this effect. Okay. Then I've got stages in the process model. Stages in the process model. Which can be a linear process or a cyclical process. So this is an organizational learning cycle, which was formulated by a person, person called Dixon. Now, the organizational learning theory is a framework that tries to explain um, how people learn within organizations. And he talks about the fact that in an organization, okay, let me explain that. This is built out of what we call the theory of meaning structures, which was developed by McLean. McLean is, in his PhD, developed what we call the theory of meaning structures. Then Dixon, who was a senior scholar, Nancy Dixon, came back and took that theory and then expanded it to develop the organizational learning cycle. Now, according to um, um, McLean and Dixon, this is what they say. In organizations, people have what we call accessible private meanings and then collective meanings. Private meanings is what you hold, hold and do not share with others. Pri collective meanings is what we put in the organization for us to all discuss, like when we organizational minutes, like codified procedures of operation within the organization. Now, according to Dixon, learning lies in the accessibility of knowledge. So for an organization to learn, they should find measures in which they will empower people to share and what they have, they know privately, and then allow people in the organization to challenge what is held collectively. So you can challenge existing knowledge in the organization, which is called codified, or you can also create an environment that people have opportunity to share what they know. So many organizations, like you may check in maybe Rachel's office or maybe uh, uh, Philip's office, you may realize that there is something called Monday morning meetings. These Monday morning meetings are supposed to cause accessible knowledge to be created or accessible meanings to be created. So people share what happened in their perspective last week uh, privately and what they have learned from their own divisions and other people come from different units and share their own. So private meanings are being shared. Then from there, it reconstruct the collective meaning so that now we can say collectively by this week, our aim is to do this, we will achieve this and we will achieve that. And that becomes a collective meaning informed by their private meaning. So Dixon argued that if you want to create more accessible meanings, you need to learn to generate information from different sources of the organization, integrate the information into the respective units, then interpret it to, to their respective work activities and empower them to act upon it. That is how you create more accessible meanings. Now, this particular concept, according to Dixon, say, is that when you go to the public sector, the, the collective meanings are more than the private meanings and, the, and then the, even the accessible meanings. So in the public sector, the collective meanings try to suffocate everything. When you go to the private sector, especially like consultancies, when we are building skills around, the company is built around people's individual skill sets, like, like, like those of you who are in the law firms. So now the private meanings tend to matter because everybody is a specialist. I'm a divorce lawyer. I'm a... Uh, mergers and acquisition lawyer, I'm a land litigation lawyer. So everybody has got his own private meaning and we bring to the collective. So the private means are more. But he said the ideal organization is the one that tries to increase more of the accessible meaning structures. That's all the theory of meaning structures. The organizational learning cycle tries to explain. Okay. I use this in my, my master's for my, my long lesson. So that's why you see me being able to explain it very well. Okay, I can share it with my master's with you for you to look at it. Okay. Then you also have those ones which are in a linear format, like we saw earlier. Then you can conceptualize it, not in a cyclical manner, you can also conceptualize it in a, in a straight path. So traders 
you go to my mobile phones, going to pre-trade stages of trade benefits and impact. This is a conceptualized model uh, framework based on the theory of transaction cost theory and other literature readings. This one is coming from one literature, another literature, another literature. They are put together and they are used to do an explanation. Okay. And then you have the next one that has to do with hierarchical um, 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 relationship. So hierarchy-based conceptual frameworks showed that concepts are related in higher and lower positions of a scale. And those of you who did um, organizational behavior, you realize that there was a model called the Maslow hierarchy of needs. So in the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you've got the, the hierarchy of needs that people have. From starting from which is a part of choice or motivation, physiological safety, belonging, self esteem, and self actualization. So, people at a different, different levels. Now, I'm, this is a theory that exists already. The reason why I'm showing you that somebody can develop a conceptual model by looking at it in terms of a hierarchy, this is the hierarchy that exists in the, in, the, in, the, in the variables he's trying to study. But this one was done by Maslow. After a lot of studies, Maslow established this particular theory. So remember, a theory is ended at what was once a conceptual model. That's why I'm teaching you how people conceptualize. So people can conceptualize in a hierarchy form. And then others can also conceptualize using maps and coordinates. If you can remember, um, if you can remember, um, most of the people who know about demand and supply curve, know it about it from it being a maps and coordinates type of study. So you have price and, a, and then you have quantity. Then you have an equilibrium occurring in between demand and then supply. Okay. So this one is based on maps and coordinates. There are other models that are also based on maps and coordinates. Those of you have been seeing how some, some of the, have been following the coronavirus especially. If you see some of the scientists, when they are conceptualizing the time that we'll have a break, um, our peak, they use maps and coordinates and they are doing what conceptualization theorizing or conceptualizing how the, the disease grows and the, 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 the disease spreads, it gets to a peak and then begins to fall down. All of these is conceptualizations. All of these are conceptualizations. Okay. And then gap analysis. Some people also do studies based on gap analysis. What do you mean by gap analysis? The relationship, that means that this is what we expected, this is what we got. So there's a gap between the design and then the reality. So most of the studies, um, there, are, there are models that are gap-based models. What they try to do is that this is what the customers expected and this is what the customers got. One of such models is what we call the um, service quality model, which is a very popular model. Service quality is one of the most research areas in management because it, it's, it's actually cuts across so many things. And quality is an, an ability for um, a, 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 um, a, somebody to offer a service that exceeds the satisfaction of the, of the customer. So that's what we define by quality. So in quality, you are trying to exceed the satisfaction of the customer. It's not trying to meet the satisfaction, you exceed it. That's where you can define quality. Now service quality means that the, you ask, the customer is a multi-scale and developed to assess the customer's perception of service quality. That's the self car model. So developed by Parasuman and others, uh, Leonard and then, uh, and then, uh, Zitmat in 1988. Now, the service quality model talks about the fact that it, as it represents the discrepancy between a customer's expectation to a service offering and a customer's uh, perception of what is received. So you answer questions based on a scale, and these questions are in dimensions on tangibility of the service, reliability of the service, responsiveness of the service, assurance of the service, and empathy of the service. So self power model, which is also um, a theory now. Okay, now I'm, 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 I'm saying certain things that can confuse you, but I'll come back to it later. self power model, which is also a theory now, is based on this kind of conceptualizations. This kind of conceptualizations, okay. Then, let's look at the building blocks of a theory. So what are the components of a theory? Now that we know how to concept, people conceptualize, what are the components of a theory? Now, Theories are, ideally, theories are uh, what? An organized, or coherent, and systematic articulation of issues that are communicated as a meaningful whole. I mentioned that theories 
are a current set of general propositions which are used as principles of explaining apparent um, uh, observed phenomena, apparent relationships in observed phenomena. Okay, so theories provide complex and comprehensive conceptual understandings. This thing by conceptual understanding of things that can not be pinned down, how societies work, how organizations operate, why people will interact in a certain, certain ways. So when you see a theory, they cannot, it doesn't just try to explain very simple things. They try to explain complex things in simple ways. That's what theories try to do. Complex things in simple ways. Theories are built out of conceptual frameworks or conceptual models. And the conceptual models, the objective is to simplify reality. So by the time you finish a develop a theory, a theory is supposed to simplify reality too. Simplify reality. So complex things are explained in a very simple way. The building blocks of a theory. Okay, sorry, I jumped something. You use the theory to help design the research question. So you realize from uh, Sabrina's work, the theory is the theory led us to develop the brown lab conceptual model. When we develop the brown lab conceptual model, it led to the research question, the, the questionnaire that will inform the data collection. So whatever thing you do, you should know that the theories can inspire or help design your research question and research questionnaire. That means that it will help you to collect the relevant data and you also interpret the data and propose certain explanations of causes and influences. When you look at the post-study framework, now that you have finished your study, you can now see that based on the theory that you use or the, or the research framework that you use, these are the understanding that we have concerning brand lab. Okay. Now, there are four building blocks of a theory, the key aspects of a theory. The first one has to do with constructs. Constructs uh, abstract concepts specified at high level of abstraction and chosen to simplify or, or to explain the phenomenon of interest. So when we take the theory of plan behavior, the constructs are what? Attitude, and then what? Subjective norm, and then what again? Um, intention, and then what again? Actual performance of the behavior, and then what again? Perceived perceive behavioral control. So these are the constructs of the study that I expect as variables. Variables are just measurable constructs. So sometimes the construct is called um, attitude, but how do you measure it? Then you have a set of questions that can be able to use to measure it, or you have another variable that can be able to use to measure it. Let me explain something very wrong here. I know I'm, I'm, you may not understand it, but look at this one. Perceive behavioral control, how will you measure it? I will measure it by propensity to um, anthropomorphize and then affordability. So I'll ask questions on these two, then it will help me to be able to measure perceive behavioral control. But these ones are these constructs are, are also variables in their way because they can the measurement skills have been developed already. So if you look at it, attitude has its measurement skill. Okay, so let me look at it. This is Brand Lab. Brand Lab has 22 items for measuring it. And look at it very careful. Brand Lab is a very large concept. So they have got variables within it. The variables or the antecedents of Brand Lab are uniqueness, pleasure, intimacy, duration, memories, and dreams. These things come together to measure brand lab. And each of them have items that we use to measure. And we have grouped the item into five different item, um, five different categories that measure brand lab. So brand lab is the construct. The uniqueness and the uh, 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 pleasure and intimacy are the variables that measure the construct. Are we good? Okay. Look at the attitude. Attitude itself is a construct and can also be expressed as a variable already. So there's no need for you to break it down. So here, here you can get questions concerning it. That's easier. Subjective norm to this one, he, he's also broken it down. Look at what society. Remember I mentioned society. And I told our people. And I told that people are important peers. People who are important to me. Remember I mentioned it. I said peers can influence you and society can influence you. All of them come to subjective norm. Now, when you come to um, perceive behavior control, I've got two. Affordability and propensity and to So these ones are there. These two, affordability and propensity to emphasize, measures perceived behavioral control. So when you have, listen carefully, when you have, when you have a construct, you have to know how you're going to measure it. You may need that, you may need to measure it by bringing certain variables together. Or itself, sometimes some constructs are, are well developed that they themselves can be expressed as a variable on their own. They don't need to have sub variables to measure them. But some constructs are very complex. You need other variables to come together to measure that one particular construct, like love. Okay. So propositions. 
Propositions are the associations or the postulations of relationship between the construct and the between the constructs in based on a deductive logic. Sometimes we call it hypothesis in the quantitative work, and then qualitative people call it propositions. But propositions are just the relations that exist between constructs. Constructs, that's all. So you can't just drop, you can't just drop the variables that you have to have a relationship. Like this one influences this, this one influences that. Okay. Now, logic is like the glue that connects the theoretical constructs and provides meaning. Remember, we defined we said, uh, 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 theory as a coherent set of general propositions. When I said coherency, I said coherency means that they come together to establish a meaning. And that is the logic. The logic means that what ties them together. So if you look at L times B, the logic is to generate what? Area. So the area is what ties them to, together. The construct is L times B. The proposition is multipl the multiplication. Multiply L times B. That's the relationship between the two. If you go to area of a rectangle or a triangle, the logic is what? To find the area of the triangle. The, the variables or the constructs are base and height. The proposition says find half of the base and multiply it by the height. So you have got multiplication and you have got um, division to taking place. So division and, uh, and multiplication are part of the uh, propositions that define the area of a, um, a triangle. Now, every theory has got its assumptions about values, time, and space, and has got its boundary conditions, where it can be applied and where it cannot be applied. You should be very careful. For example, when you say that you are using L times B, you are actually saying that you are assuming that the thing you are looking at has a longer side called the L, and that L is a perfect straight line. And there's another one called um, weight or B, breadth. That is also a perfect straight line. So if you multiply L times B, you get, the, you get what? The area of a rectangle. That's the assumption you are taking. That is why I was saying that that is the theoretical area of your land, L times B. But if you go to the actual land, you can realize that sometimes the other person has built and come into part of your land. And the way it's been done, you cannot even break, you have to break the person's wall. Or sometimes even the road comes a little bit into the your land. Or even sometimes, you may have a river or a tree or something that is the, the topology of the land doesn't make it easy for you to build on that side of the land. So your actual uh, accessible space can be less than the L times B. Some people to have bought land, even though it was L times B, but the way the topography of the land is, he ends up getting more than L times B. He ends up getting more than L times B. So what I'm just trying to emphasize here is that all the theories have got assumptions. You are assuming that the land is going to be perfect L a straight line and be a, a perfect, a straight line, but it may not be always like that. So any time that you are using the, um, the length and the breadth, which is the area of a rectangle, you are assuming that the body, the shape of the, of the object or the shape of the item or the phenomenon that you are looking for the area is, has a longer side, has a shorter side, and that's why I multiply L times B. However, that becomes your assumption going. Now, the boundary condition says that you have to know where it can be applied and cannot be applied. You cannot use that one to find the area, the length times breadth to find the area of a rectangle because it doesn't, its application is different. It's not a base thing, it doesn't have a height. It just got L times B. The same thing is that if certain theories to have to, their, their own boundary conditions, the theory of plant behavior is, looks as, intended behavior by an individual, not by an organization, not by a company, not by, not by a country, an individual. So you can use the employee behavior, consumer behavior, individual behavior, a president's behavior, but you cannot use to study an economic system. You can use to study a doctor's behavior, but you cannot use it to study a, a, a whole hospital, unless your objective is to study the patient in the hospital. So anytime you are using a theory, know the boundary. What level does it operate in? So that you, can, you don't apply something that doesn't apply at a particular level. You can't use the theory of plan behavior to look at an economic system like capitalism. It doesn't help you. Because there are, there are theory for capitalism that exists in their own space. And that is what you should use. So every theory has got its boundary condition, where it can be applied and where it cannot be applied. And it has got the assumption, what it assumes that uh, what it assumes um, to be occurring or 
to be um, to be def to be the definitional concept of the construct. You are assuming that the, this is this and this is that, and that's how you can apply it. Okay. Now, how are theories generated? Theories are generated um, in, in possibly in four key ways. Four key ways. It could be more, but four key. Ways. The first one is when people have data and they study the data. They can study the data to observe patterns. And by saying they take the data, study it for some time and observe patterns, and they end up coming out with a theory. Oh, this is how things work. Oh, okay, this is how things work. This is how things work. Okay. Now, sometimes others also use approach too. They have a defined framework of how things work and they apply it on the data. And then they try to look at for they use the data to go to shape what they mean by the defined framework, and then they end up coming up with a theory. So you have an idea of what could be happening. So that will be your preliminary defined framework. Then you go into the data, you take the data alongside the defined framework to inductively come up with, the, oh, this is, the, this is how the thing works. They can theorize. So either you start from a fresh from theory, which is from data, which is called grounded theory building. Means that you are, you are just grounded on the theory, the, the data that exists, or the empirical observations. Or you have an idea of, you can conceptualize that this and this may work in this particular way. Then I apply the framework to the data and I use it to generate the theory. The last way is that you, you, don't, you don't try to look at the data. You start from an existing theory and you apply it to a new context. So for example, somebody can take theories of learning behavior and apply it to organizational behavior, like what you saw concerning Dixon. Dixon took a McLean's concepts about how people learn in the, the, that's the private meaning and the theory of meaning structure, that's what it's called. The private meaning, the collective meaning, accessible meaning. And she applied it to organization to study how organizations learn. Because an organization is a collection of individuals who, um, who left large, who left unattended will largely pursue individual goals. So in organization, individuals are, are not left unattended. They are left attend, they are attended to, they are bounded by, principles, they are bounded by theory and associations, they are, they are bounded by um, policies and associations and governs and, go, and governed by certain uh, organizational ethics and rules and values. So they are tied together with a given purpose. Now when an organization exists, how they learn will stem from how individuals learn. So listen then study how individuals learn organization and then move it to organizational level to develop the organizational learning framework. So you can either take an existing theory of one for explaining one issue, and then you extend it to be able to understand how it, another, another uh, to be able to understand how um, a, uh, in another concept, so that theory can apply, be applied. Then you develop your own theory of that phenomenon. So you can develop your own theory based on existing theory. That's what you're trying to see. Then sometimes others also develop their own theory based on studying existing theory in a similar context but different. So let's, let's say that somebody develops a theory about how things work in maybe Nigeria. And then you take that theory and then take it to Ghana and come to try to test it. So context D and context E are the same. But they, are, they share similar uh, relationship. Then you take your theory that was postulated in context D and then try to, uh, to study the same issue in context E to see whether their findings can be similar. Then you can end up saying that, oh, it looks like we can theorize that this thing happens in all contexts that have got similar characteristics as this. Okay, somebody is asking questions. Okay. Well, can one take a particular approach based on the type of research it's carrying out? Okay, you are not supposed to develop theories. This is, I'm talking about how academics develop theories to use. You are, most of you, what you do is that you will be doing this one, any of these two. You take a theory which is existing and you apply it to a different thing or a different issue. Or you take a theory that somebody has used to study maybe brand lab in Nigeria and you come and use it to study brand lab in Ghana. That's all. So that then now you can say, this is how it works in Ghana. That's what most of you do. This is what most of you do. This one, there's this, the theories exist already and you are extending the theory or you are enhancing understanding of the theory. This, this first two, this first two, the theory doesn't exist already. You are picking from the data and then trying to generate a theory. 
this one and this one. The, the, the tree doesn't exist already. You are picking from the data, empirically from the data to generate your own tool. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. So let me give an example. Now, how are theory generated? So let's use this particular one because this is using a lot of um, so many studies. But this guy came up with um, a model called the technology acceptance model. Now, somebody is asking, Prof, some of them are using the word model, some of them are using theory, some of them are using framework. I'm getting confused. I'll explain all these dimensions later. later. I want you to understand what you are doing first. Okay, so there's a theory called the technology acceptance model, which was developed by Davis. Now, Davis in 1989 developed a model that explains that for you to be able to determine uh, why a person uses a technology, you can realize that there are two factors that influence the person's intention and the usage behavior. So based on other works you have read from technology acceptance model and from, from theory of plan behavior and theory of reason action, Davis came up with a model that says that a person's intention to use a technology is influenced by his perception about the usefulness of the technology and his perception about the ease of use. So these two are technology deterministic factors, the, the usefulness of the technology and the perceived usefulness of the technology. So if I perceive that um, iPhone is easy, is easy to use, it will be this one. And if I perceive that I, 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 iPhone will be useful for my work activity or my learning activity, it will be this one. Those two can inform my intention to use iPhone. That will lead to my actual usage of the iPhone. That's all I can do. So when you're studying technology, what you're trying to emphasize here, mobile money or anything, it could actually be influenced by the perceived usefulness or perceived ease of use to generate it. Now this is a very a widely used model. So after it was developed, others kind of applied it. So I applied it to study, um, is a conceptual model for M-commerce adoption among traders. I tried, tried to study mobiles and um, trading in Nigeria. So in Nigeria, we're trying to study why, um, how marketing may use mobile phones for trade. And we realized that, one, there's perceived ease of use and there's perceived usefulness. The I conceptualize like the perceived ease of use of a, of a technology can influence, shape a person's e e usefulness of the technology and this usefulness can shape a person's intention to adopt and then the actual usage of the technology. Okay. Then I also conceptualize that based on the literature I've read, that when you use the technology for a longer time, it can also lead to this particular impact. And the impact can reinforce your using. The impact can reinforce the using. However, so this is the level of the adopter. All these things is actually influenced by the person's knowledge of mobile phones. And then by the readiness of the external content, if there's accessibility of the mobile network or affordability. So we have what accessibility and affordability. Okay, now this is accessibility and accessibility. Yeah. So accessibility is supposed to, one of them is supposed to be affordability. So, <clears throat> so you realize here that these are the things that can influence a person's choice of using the mobile phone. Person's choice of using the mobile phone. So you have the, um, the, the concept about the adoption, which will influence the extent of users, usage. But the adoption is influenced by perceived usefulness, and then ease of use influences perceived usefulness. Now look at it very carefully. What you don't see me doing is that I've done this one, ease of use going here. I didn't do ease of use straight to intention to use. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. So that's what I was telling you. Sometimes it depends on the relationship you want to hypothesize in your work. Okay. Now, for a theory, I'll come back to how theories are developed again. So, for a theory to be seen as being relevant for your work, we have to have certain attributes of a good theory, apart from the dimensions or the building blocks. All theories should have logical consistency. It means that at the theoretical construct, the propositions, boundary con condition, assumption, logically consistent with each other. They have to relate with each other. You cannot sometimes construct and present non rational concepts, and that makes the theory very, very weak. So sometimes somebody puts in something that cannot be measured. And then, or you put in a variable that has so many other relationships before it can occur. So it doesn't make sense in just stating it. So they have to be logically related to each other. If you are saying that you are discussing um, that you should find L times B, that means that. L 
has to be there, B has to be there, and we have to multiply together. Now you have to understand what assumptions you have of it, of the L, what assumptions you have of the B. All these things have to be well defined so that people can understand how to be able to use the theory. So they have to come together to come to form a coherent whole so that I can explain what you're trying to do. Then the theory should have a good explanatory power. I will give us illustrations as we go on. Explanatory power means how much does the given theory explain the, or predict the reality. Some good theories are obviously explain the target phenomenon better than the rival theories. So the theory that you're using, can you explain um, can you explain the concept you are trying to study better? Can you explain the concept you are trying to study very well? That's the question that he's trying to say. Or are there, there, are there as other aspects of the concept you are trying to study that is not well explained by the theory? Let me give an example here. So remember that we looked at this paper. Um, okay, let me just use this one. Okay, okay look at this paper. If you look at the model, posteri model, posteri model. Now look at this. Problem. We are saying that we saw this one: the stages of trade in economics, benefits of this thing from um, information systems research, benefits of technology on trade or uh, commerce, and then impact. Of, we also saw it in mobiles. Now all of these things are being put together to make sense. But you realize that the one, the mod, the explanation we are using here cannot apply to these ones. Because the literature is only just for here. The literature is just for here. The literature is just for here. I can't take, just take the literature on strategic benefits, relational benefits, operational benefits, and apply it to everything here. Because they are all different, different, different explanations. So we need to know that sometimes you have a theory that cannot, or a model, a theory that you have in mind cannot explain everything that you are seeing. So you have to know what, to what extent is the theory helping your work. It can only explain an aspect. Another theory will explain an aspect. Another theory may explain an aspect of your work. That's what I was trying to emphasize by the statement here. Okay, so from there, look at this logical consistency and explanatory power. This guy has said that political instability leads to unemployment, um, high interest rate leads to unemployment, lack of salary capital leads to unemployment. But in reality, can political stability just get up and just lead to unemployment? That's the question that we're asking ourselves. This concept, you are conceptualizing this way, but political stability doesn't have to go through something before it can lead to unemployment. Hmm? Political stability can't go to one or two other issues before it can generate unemployment. Because when you have political instability, what then what happens? When you have political instability, people have lost confidence in the economy, or the, the the economy is not safe for for trade. So what then will happen? People are told to stay home. They are coup d'etats. Or their curfews. Now, if that thing is happening, like a coup, which is really coming from political instability, it will affect the market. The market is affected, people can't go to work. So it means that people are, can become unemployed. Or certain companies are bombed or destroyed, they become unemployed. Political instability didn't just get up and go to unemployment, it led to instability in the, in, 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 in the market, which also uh, led to maybe. Um, on, 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 on safe environment or on, on, on safe um, on safe uh, um, 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 on safe places that people can operate in. In case you are selling on your on your tabletop, and now there's political instability and there's a coup d'état, you can't go and sit by your tabletop because you, you are afraid for your life. So what what happened? Certain things did happen before unemployment or on occurred. Those things that happen, if you are able to address them, that means that unemployment will not occur. That's what I'm trying to say. So we cannot just say that all unemployment just get up and just lead to unemployment. Um, um, political instability and just, just gets up and just reach unemployment. There are certain things that it can, it can preempt or, uh, or trigger. When it triggers those events, then it leads to unemployment. It leads to unemployment. So political instability can also affect market conditions and even investors lose confidence in the market. That can also lead to the loss of jobs. That will lead that leads to Poor, poor income made by uh, some of the companies that will lead to unemployment. So we need to be very careful how we jump and just draw arrows. Does the literature tell you that political instability just got up and just led to unemployment? What does the literature say? How does what how the literature explain it? And you can use that one to guide you to talk about relationships. So don't just draw relationships in terms of arrows. Make sure that the literature tells that that there's a possible relation between this and this before you can be able to establish that occurring.
Oh, okay. But instead of instability, stability. Ah, uh, sorry. This political stability is supposed to be instability, sorry. So political instability. So thank you very much. I didn't see it. <laughs> then I'll edit my slides. Thank you very much. Wait, so I've, been, I've been teaching this thing without looking at it. Okay. So political instability, how does it lead to unemployment? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so then let's go again. The other two other attributes of a good theory is that a, a good theory, Philip, thank you very much. A good theory should, be, should have a degree of falsifiability. Falsifiability means that a theory should be able to be disproved or should be given, in, we should have enough information about a theory so that we can test it. Science depends on reliability and accuracy. So if we cannot test what you are saying and cannot challenge it, then we cannot call accept it as a theory. Every theory should, should, should be able to give us opportunity for us to check whether the empirical data match with the theoretical propositions. In other words, theories cannot be theory unless they can be empirically testable. So you have to be able to empirically test what the person, the relation the person is postulating. Then lastly, all theories should be parsimonious. Parsimonious that try means that means that we the objective of us developing a theory is to simplify reality. So try to use simple things to explain concept issues, complex issues. So all theories should be parsimonious, meaning that we should use the smallest number of variables or fewer number of variables to explain complex phenomena. Instead of having a very complex relations that using so many variables and it helps us, it actually confuses us. That's not what we want. We want you to, you to explain complex things with fewer variables. Otherwise, it's important to break the most the complex things into different parts so that I can explain it in different, different issues. Okay, so if you look at this particular study. If you look at the study that I showed you earlier, there are a lot of things here. To be able to, able to understand it very well, we, we took different um, um, relationship discussions within the literature and to explain each part. This one, there's a discussion on it. This one, there's a discussion on it. This one, there's a discussion on it. All of them are coming together to be able to help us understand uh, how mobile phones influence trade. We didn't just pick one theory that can explain everything because it was not Nothing like that existed. But we realized that in the literature, there have been discussion of, uh, of models or explanations of how this one occurs, impact occurs, how benefits occur, and how studies of trading occur. That was much more measurable and easy for us to carry out than or parsimonious than rather trying to have one that is trying to explain, explain so many complex things. So if you look at it, the explanation for that particular theory is very simple. If you look at it very carefully. Look at, look at the first time we postulated. This is the first time we postulated it. Look at the explanation. In summary, regarding micro trading, traders may use mobile phones in pre trade, during trade, and post trade. Look at it. Pre trade, during trade, and post trade. Then it goes on to say this application of mobile phones in trade may lead, may generate operational, relational, and strategic benefits, which may have an incremental transformational and production effect. That's all. It has explained it in a very simple way. But you see, before we could get the impact, we found some explanation for that. Before we could get benefit, we found explanation. Stages of trade, we found explanation for it. Those of you who don't know it, look at it here. Beyond the benefits, the next question to be asked is the potential impact on trade. The mobiles for development perspective, mobiles are conceptualized, conceptualized to have three effects on adopters, incremental amplification, transformation, and then production. Then it goes to explain. So it is not, this is coming from um, one study, his and Jugan. Then if you go up here, he does also the similar thing again. Look at over here. Okay, he says that, okay. The combination of these benefit features and attributes of mobile phones in transaction activities in trade has the potential of generating strategic relational and operational benefits for the trader. These benefits are related, are related, to, are related to the posited benefits of using ICT in commerce or the acute benefits of using ICT in commerce. So now, on, however, in this paper, mobile phones are the form of ICTs being discussed. Operational benefits are this. Relational benefits are that. Strategic benefits are that. This is also coming from a different understanding. So in all, what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to maintain parsimony. 
parsimonity if there's a word like that, or we are trying to parsimonious. What we are trying to say is that we are using simple, simple concepts that explain each part of the work to be able to explain that what we are trying to do so that we end of the day, we can be able to have a, a holistic perspective that tells a good story. So parsimonious means that we examine the phenomenon, how the phenomenon, the phenomenon can be explained by fewer variables. So we broke the phenomenon into different pieces or different stages, the trading stage, the benefit stage, and then the what? The impact stage. And we found fewer variables to explain each of the stages so that we can come together as a collective whole. So theories are supposed to be what? Parsimonious. The same thing happens to the paper that you read earlier on brand love. So if you look at it very carefully, he had... He had the theory of plan behavior is what is being used. But the theory of plan behavior has got different concepts. This one was okay, this one, this one, you need to find concepts to explain it. So he took two concepts here. And Brown Love, he found five other concepts uniqueness, uh, memories, and dreams to explain that one. Uniqueness, pleasure, intimacy, and memories of dreams to be able to explain these ones. But these things are not in the theory of plan behavior, they are actually in the Brown Love concept. So he took each of them and conceptualized it in a particular way so that he can put them together using the theory of plan behavior. What we are trying to emphasize here is that try to explain, simplify the things you are trying to do when you are using, using theories. Try to simplify it, the things you are trying to do so that you can use fewer variables to explain what you are trying to do. Okay. Now, all theories have got a time value. It means that certain times, times can, certain times can influence how theories are accepted or even used or challenged. Okay, so the first one has to, I'm, I'm going to use an example here to explain it to you. There's a gentleman called Delon and McLean. Delon and McLean developed a model called the IS success model in 1992. 10 years after, they came back themselves and gave another updated one called the IS success model updated version. Uh, that's information system success model. That was trying to explain why, um, how to be able to um, use technology in organizational context successfully. So what are the benefits that you may get in using it in, within an organization, an organization context? Now, 10 years after, after they have been critiqued by a lot of people, they came back and updated it. The, the technology acceptance model I mentioned earlier, TAM, has gone through about four stages. They've got time one, time two, time three, time four. All because people come and critique it and add new things to it and add new things to it. Because of that, somebody then critique the time four and then put it all together into a new model, which I'll talk about later. Then you also have the trail plan behavior. Somebody also said that this trail plan behavior is good, but nobody breaks, he was arguing that Agen didn't tell us what goes into attitude and to break it down into different components for us. He didn't break down subjective norm, and then allow pe different people to break down perceived real control depending on their work. So somebody called, uh, came up again with a new theory called Taylor and Todd. They came up with a new theory called the decomposed uh, theory of plan behavior, breaking down the theory of plan behavior co co concepts. Okay. So let's look at it, um, these examples. And time is what differentiates how these things work. Okay, thank you, Felix. Okay, so the theory of plan, reason action comes from, <coughs> comes from um, Agenda and Fisher. We developed it in 1975. And they said that attitude and subjective norm tend to influence a person's behavior to perform, uh, intention to perform a particular behavior. Now, this was a very good one. But it was talking about what is behind a person's action. Then later, they themselves, 1985 and in, in 1981, Ajahn came back with a critique and said that, ah, this thing I developed earlier, I think I have to look at it again. It doesn't, there are certain impediments that can, I should say, situational issues that can influence the performance of behavior, but it's not captured. So he then brought in the subjective norm and added it to it. Then Taylor and Todd, 
after 10 years again. So you can see 1975, 1985, and 1995. Don't, don't wear an axe prof. Uh, so every 10 years, somebody has to come up with a new journal. No, I'm just saying that it's just this is coincidental. 10 years after, by 10 years, 20, 20, that the work goes through a series of critiques and people try to make it better. Taylor and Todd then said that, okay, it's important to break down what is in attitude, what is in subjective norm, and what is in perceived overall control. So Taylor and Todd broke it down to attitude is perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use and compatibility. This is in relation to technology studies. Remember, theory of plan behavior does not, not for technology, it comes for any type of behavior. But this one, this guy called Todd and Taylor and Todd was saying, let us break down the theory of plan behavior for, I call it the composed theory of plan behavior, but for using it in a technology type of studies. So you have got compatibility, ease of use, and perceived usefulness. This compatibility and ease of use is coming from Davis' work. Remember Davis' work? Davis' work was on what? Um, the technology acceptance model. So he went to attitude. Then compatibility is coming from Rogers' work called Diffusion of Innovation. So the guy was picking from other people's work. Then he goes to subjective norm. Subjective norm, he defined it as peer influence and superior influence. Superior influence can come from the society or can come from um, a measure of um, people in the society that the person who, we are, who is answering this questionnaire considers the person to be superior. Then, perceived global control, which is situational impediment, starts from self-efficacy, a person's own assessment of himself, and then resource facilitating conditions, like money, what can give you the resource, and then technology facilitating conditions, which has to do with skills and stuff. So he has got three of them again coming here. So, and then I got, so he is saying that these three come and inform perceived global control, and they go on to inform what you are seeing here. So he has decomposed the theory of plan behavior for technology studies or technology related studies. Somebody can also decompose it for a different type of study. Okay. Now, look at the decomposed theory of plan behavior using somebody using it to study e filing. How people, so perceived ease of e filing. Perceive usefulness of e filing and then perceive res risk of e filing and perceive placefulness of e filing. Okay, an e filing attitude. Okay. Then you also have subjective norm, interpersonal and external influence. I think there's a spelling mistake here. But this is actually a drawing from the paper itself. So the, it's from the paper. Then internet and perceived global control. We have got internet efficacy perceived controllability and perceived resources, all going to perceive uh, behavioral control and leading to behavior intention. See, the actual performance of behavior was one I highlighted in this study. This is somebody who applied it in a study of e-filing, using electronic to, electronic to file, I don't know whether it's in an organizational context or in an election context, but it's for e-filing. Okay. Then, somebody then uses to study brand lab. We just looked at this one already. We studied it already and we have modified it. Then later on, a guy called Venkatash went to see Davis. Davis was the one who did the technology acceptance model and then joined, his, joined a one of his students called Morris. And I think Venkatash was rather the student. And then Morris and then Davis were the seniors in the area who came together to help Vengatash come up with a better model of explaining user acceptance of information technology. So after studying all the models, Vengatash et al. came up with this particular one in 2003. Look at the years again. Then I come to 2003. He says that for us to be able to talk about use behavior for a technology, you have to look at the use performance expectancy, what you expect the technology should do, that's perceived usefulness. Effort expectancy, what is perceived ease of, ease of use. Social influence, that is subjective, subjective norms. Facilitating condition, that is, has to do with um, perceived behavioral control. You see what is happening? These things come to inform a person's intention to perform a behavior and then use of the behavior. But now, 
The guy called Vengatash said that there are other factors that people have not been talking about that can moderate, can either enhance the effect of the variables or can reduce the effect of the variable. One is gender, another is age, another is experience the person brings, and another is voluntarity, the voluntariness that is associated with it. Some technologies may be imposed on people, so it may not come out of voluntariness. So voluntarity, uh, or voluntariness of use, the experience the person has in using similar products the uh, similar technology, age, and then the gender can come into being. So that he developed this particular model. After reading and critiquing so many of the other models, he developed this one and tested it. And this Vengatash model is what we call the UT, AUT model. To tell you the truth, as of today, as I'm talking, somebody has now come with, he himself, Vengatash, has now come with the UT, AUT T model version 3. <laughs> So they keep on moving the goalposts as we said to explain. But technically, if you do is the number three, the, the first one, this very very one, it's still valid. People still use it. People still use it, it's still valid in research. You can go ahead and use it. Those of you who want to do social media studies, this can help you. Anything has to do with technology related to this model. If you you see now the problem is that if this model exists and you go back to go and pick um something like technology acceptance model, people will ask you that the technology acceptance model is very narrow. It doesn't capture all the variables. But even though this one exists, somebody can still go use theory of plant behavior because theory of plant behavior is just about plant behavior, not necessarily about all these other variables that are coming there. But you can see, those of you that are smart, you can see theory of plant behavior inside. In fact, somebody is saying that this is theory of plant behavior that has been injected with moderators. Yeah, moderators just here. Well, this is, this is perceived behavior control. This is subjective norms. This is, uh, these two are attitudes. So this one is just two of one behavior that has been injected with <laughs> moderators. The, all the other ones didn't have the moderators there. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. That's a very, 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 very good question. Very, very, very good statement. Philip, these are all out of research gaps. People challenge the work. They challenge the work. That's why the gaps are. That's why 10 years, seven years after. After people, because Technology changes, society changes. So what we postulated in 1975 doesn't seem to apply in, in 1985. And what we postulated, that's why I said sometimes theories are time-bound. Some theories are timeless. And by some theories are also time-bound because you are studying society. And the society you have changed, your study has changed. Your behavior has changed, which actually informs the kind of technologies, the, 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 the type of variables that will come out or the type of new relationships that will come up. So very, very good point. Very, 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 very good point. Very, very good point. Okay, so we are now getting to the end of our slides and examples of theories. Okay, so first of all, if you want theories, ask your supervisors <laughs> or you look at examine uh, papers that have been published or there are some links that are put here that can help you. Or you can even type the name of what you want to study and just add theory. Like you want to study consumer behavior, like consumer behavior theory and put it in Google or Google Scholar. It will just give you the theories. Because people have, over the years, people have categorized the theories well, 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 well given already. And I also hopefully, share, I think I shared a book of theories on the platform. I'll check. If it's not there, I'll try and upload it. A book with so many theories in it. Okay, and how the theory can be used and how it has been used. So in economics and finance, those from coming from economics and finance and accounting, you see these type of models a lot. Arbitrary tripricing theory, rational choice theory, prospect theory, accumulative, accumulative prospect theory, Monte Carlo option theory, option model, Binomial options pricing model. Um, arbitrary pricing theory, for example, addresses the general theory of asset pricing. So it depends on what you are trying to do. Modern portfolio theory. I mean, I'm not a finance person, but I'm just introducing to some of them. There are theories in economics which are also categorized by based on what they are doing. These are the boundaries. Some of them are schools of thought, like Marxism, Keynesian, Neoclassical, Austrian school. These are all schools of thought. But they are used as principle for explanation. That's why they are called theories. Economic systems like capitalism, um, free market capitalism, market socialism, central planning, mercantilism, mercantilism, and shock therapy, Washington consensus. These are all existing economic systems that, exist, that are there. Then there are economic cycles. And then there's also growth theories. Growth theories are new classical growth, new growth theory, human capital, rule of law, and then it's to growth. Now, do you see that they are all in different boundaries. I can't take 
economic system to go and study economic cycle. You can I take economic cycle to go and study growth. You have to understand what you are doing. That's why I was telling that all theories have got their own boundaries. All theories have got their own boundaries. All theories have got their own boundaries. You are asking what are theories in each other. We are still progressing. Theories in economics and finance, global trade, comparative advantage. Now, let me just say that theories, we say that theories in economic, theories in that, does not mean that it cannot be applied in another field. For example, moral hazard can be applied in studying, um, those of you who have done, read, read a little about oil studies in Ghana, and then the finding of oil. There are theories that people have written papers that use moral hazard in, uh, in oil finds or in oil exploration. And this impact on the economy. Okay, so there's comparative advantage, there's new trade theory, there's games theory, there's rational choice theory. You see, these are choice theory, choice based on choices. Earlier, I was showing choice based on technology adoption. These are choice based on choices, choice based on trade, choice based on markets, invisible hand, rent seeking, and then choice based on tax and spend policies. So choice can have their categorizations. In accounting, we have got different theory that can help us to look at different issues of how we uh, do accounting reporting. So we have got events approach, behavioral approach, human information processing approach, predictive approach, and positive approach. So for, the, for example, in financial statements reporting, you can either use the value approach or inverse approach or the normative, a normative approach. So the value approach, the income statement is perceived as an indicator of the financial performance of the firm. Hence, you see cash flow perceived as an expression of changes in the cash. So the value is now seen, the value, the value approach uses income statement as the financial performance of the company. However, the inverse approach is different. The use income statement is perceived as a direct communication of operating events that occurred during the given period. The statement of cash flow is better perceived as an expression of the financial and investment events. In other words, events rather relevant, events re relevance rather than output than its, rather than its output on cash flow determines the reporting of the event in the statement of cash flow. So you see that the first one was looking at the income statement, what came and what left. But the other one is much more about cash flow as the expression of financial and investment and investment events. And then they use the relevance of the event rather than the output on cash flow in reporting the event in the statement of the cash flow. For so for an event to be in the cash flow, it has to be very relevant. Otherwise, it will not be captured there. You, know, you just subsume it as part of miscellaneous. But when we come to normative event story, I'm not an, an accountant, I'm just using what I've read from the literature to tell you. The normative event story of accounting has been tentatively summarized as follows. In order for interested persons to be better focus the future of social organizations and the most relevant attributes of the crucial events which affect the organization are aggregated for periodic publication free of inferential bias. The objective of the normative events theory of accounting is to maximize the forecasting accuracy of accounting reports by focusing on the most relevant attributes of the events crucial to users. So then the, then the user then becomes part of defining whether it is relevant or not. <laughs> uh, so this is Amandu, eh? okay, interesting. Then in choice in marketing, you have quite a number of them. So there's one for purchasing. Looks, remember I told you that conceptualization of, of, of theories or research, conceptual models can be expressed in terms of hierarchy. Look at this one, hierarchy of effects theory. The series of steps a consumer goes through in which they receive and use information in order to reach a decision about action to take, for example, whether to purchase or not to purchase a product. The hierarchy of representation of advertising influences a consumer decision to purchase or not to purchase a product or a service over time. So it starts from awareness, goes to knowledge, liking, preference, conviction, and purchase. Awareness, knowledge, liking, preference, conviction, and pictures. Okay. So do you see that? Awareness, liking, conviction, and pictures. So at the first stage, people need to think. So you need awareness and knowledge. Then you need to feel. 
need preference and liking. They need to make them actually consume the product by leading to a purchase. So you have to give information. So if you do advertisement, you just think and feel and don't point to place where people can buy is bad. This is one of the reasons why those of you who watch these Ghanaian adverts, you end up say, saying that those who want to buy in bulk should come here. But to form bra, those adverts, what they do is that they are emphasizing on the do part, the do part. So if you do adverts and it's just about thinking and feeling, and some adverts are just about thinking and feeling, they don't do the do part. Now, when an advert is focused on thinking and feeling, it's very likely that the, the product is well distributed already, so the consumers can see it. So we want to increase people to buy it. People um, 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 bring awareness to their mind and create the emotional response to it to go and look for it to buy. That's what you see in Coca Cola adverts. The product is all over the place. So the adverts focus on thinking and feeling. But there was a time that there was a lot of competition. So you realize that Coke started doing adverts and said that the bottle is still one CD. Why were they doing that? They were trying to emphasize on the doing, buying the, buying the thing itself. I tell telling you that the thing is cheaper than going to drink, buy even water or something like that. So sometimes the people focus, the, the practitioners focus on either the doing, the, the thinking and feeling, and they go to the doing. When you are watching adverts now, you can use this model to assess. Is the model, is the advert more about the thinking part or the feeling part or the doing part? Okay. Then we mentioned service quality model earlier, which is used in management studies, and also a lot of marketers do that because it's about service. Then we also look at strategic theories which marketers use and other strategic management researchers use. One is the structure conduct performance model, which explains why some industries are on average and other some industries are more profitable than others. The efficient perspective, which gives insight to why some firms in an industry are more profitable than others. Do you realize that the boundaries of these two models to these theories are industry, industry, not individuals, organizations, industry. Portes model, which is also about industry, provides insights into how structure and characteristics, characteristics of an industry and competitive strategy is pursued by a business jointly determined by the performance of a business. That's Portes five process model. The resource-based view, which I use for my PhD, is talks about um, sorry, talks about the resources that are available to a firm and how firm compete by virtue of the resources that you have. And the resources which are superior can help you gain more and sustain an advantage. And resources which are less superior can just help you create an advantage, but you might not be able to sustain their advantage. And the institutional theory that talks about the norms and, and in society and how it's influenced by institutional, uh, have institutional factors. So you have got things like the regulatory institution, the normative institutions, or the weighting institution, and then you have got the core of native institutions. There are different, different dimensions of it. Okay. So this is very good. Then you have got game theory, um, which is used in finance, it's also used in marketing, it's also used in so many other dimen other types of studies, in management studies. Game theory is a mathematical consider uh, analyzing how strategic interaction between individuals or agents produce outcomes based on agent choices. The agents may be assumed to have conflicting, uh, may be assumed to have conflicting priorities. Then you have got generational theory, which try to uh, talk about people who are born in generational cohort theory, using marketing, using management studies, try to emphasize that people who are born in the same generation are defined, um, defined as a 20 year period, have common attitudes or common behaviors, or share the experience that are influenced by their childhoods and shaped by their views of the world. Okay. Now you can also find other marketing theories by just picking the theory and then adding the concept and adding theory to it and, and Googling it or using Google Scholar to search for it. Entrepreneurship theories, service marketing theories, CSR theories, leadership marketing theories, consumer behavior theories. Then you go to management. Management has to deal with um, HR. In this one, we have got an HR, we have got leadership theories, we have got motivational theory. There are so many theories that exist. So you have to know the concept you are studying, just add the word theory and you get it. So in, in motivation theory, you have got Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of you have got Taylor's theories. And Taylor has um, theory of scientific management that looks at how workers are motivated mainly by P. Then you have got Hesburgh. 
Herzberg, who had close link to Maslow, believed in the two-factor theory of motivation. He was thinking that it goes beyond pay. He was thinking that certain factors that the business could introduce to directly motivate employees, that's the motivators. However, those factors would be, would be there are also factors that could de demotivate an employee if not present, but will, but will not in themselves actually motivate the employees, employees to work together. That are hygiene factors. So the motivation factors are more concerned about the job itself. For example, how interesting the job, how interesting the work is, and how much opportunity is given for extra responsibility, recognition, and promotion. Hygiene factors are factors which surround the job itself. For example, a worker will only turn up to work if the business has provided a reasonable level of pay and safe working conditions. But these factors will not make you work harder. What will make you work harder are the motivators. What will make you work harder? So some people may be paid well, but they are not treated well. So he is saying that to look at motivation in the workplace, don't look at it in terms of what makes the employees work harder. But we should also look at the factors that surround the job itself. The factors that surround the job itself. Okay. Then I got, um, so Hesbeck believed that business should motivate employees by the, adopting a democratic approach to management and by improving the nature and content of the actual job through certain methods. So some of the methods managers could use are job enlargement, job enrichment, and empowerment. That's very good. And then I got Maslow. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we know about that one, which is coming from the new relations school, you see. And then it's, it's focused on psychological needs of employees. Marshall put up a theory, put for a theory that has five levels of human needs. Okay, which employees need to have fulfilled at work. A business could therefore offer different incentives to workers in order to help them fulfill each in turn, each need in turn and progress up the hierarchy. So you have this one being here. Physiology, safety, belonging, self-esteem and self-actualization. Then theories in public administration. There are a number of different theories in public administration. One of the dominant mm -hmm. concepts that have been there, which are theory, which are used in, in public admin work, is the new public management, which denotes uh, government government policies. But the government policies since 1990 that are aimed to modernize and render more effective public sector. So one of the hypotheses of the new public management understanding or concept is the fact that it has to um, to be able to modernize the public sector, you have to have a market-oriented perspective, a market-oriented perspective, which means that you have to focus on cost efficiency for the government. So you have certain dimensions of MPM, budget cuts, performance management, change management style, contracting out, freedom to manage, one-stop shop for customers, decentralization, more use of information technology, so these are certain characteristics that you see with anybody who was trying to implement MPM. Then you also have theories in, wow, okay, theories in systems and management, information systems and management. But information systems actually borrows from so many disciplines. So if you look at it closely, you realize that you are borrowing from social sciences, you are borrowing from other management disciplines, from finance, from Finance like this, we, we borrow transaction cost theory from marketing. You can borrow hierarchy of effects theory, game theory. You can also borrow um, the cohort theory, the generation cohort theory. You can, but but um, information system because technology is becoming pervasive in so many functions of in in the organization, it's quite embracing of different different theories because of the fact that we use technology in deep, so many different and uh, social phenomena in currency. So you have got the technology acceptance more digital innovation, theory of plan behavior, transaction cost theory, resource-based theory. There's so many of them. Last part, level of a theory. Theories exist at different levels. Okay. So you have got a micro level in which the person is target, the theory is targeting an individual concept an individual concept. Then the meso level, that is targeting the firm level. So what's at the meso level? Theories for organization or social movement or communities. Then there's also a theory 
that looks at the macro level, like modernization theory, capitalism, are looking at all these things, are looking at issues at the macro level. So you have to know which level your theory is working, operating at when you are using them. When you are using them. Thank you very much. Before I shut down, I want to show you something. Uh, when we come to um, these concepts will confuse you later, so I just want to explain them. Oh, did I do the right thing? Okay. Okay, when you look at page 105 of your book, I try to explain that theories itself have degrees. I don't have it on my slide, but this one is not every, it's because I usually teach the PhD students, but it's also relevant for you if you want to understand that. Now, you see, theories have been empirically tested and you have gained some degree of acceptance to, gain, to, uh, to explain the phenomenon by scientific committee in a particular research discipline. Conceptual frameworks or approaches, on the other hand, are analytical skills which simplify reality to make it easier to analyze and research. They simplify reality by selecting certain phenomena or, or variables and suggesting relationships between them. Conceptual models are suggestive in nature and, and arguably yet to be gain sufficient empirical testing to be accepted as a theory. Thus, theories and conceptual approaches can be differentiated according to a hierarchy moving from a shallow, shallow level conceptualization to deeper theoretical based approaches. So as something may be at a lower level and climbing up. At the lowest level, we have what category based approaches that makes use of a prescribed set of factors to carry out analysis. So somebody can develop certain factors and just use it to do an analysis. They are not based on any, have any strong theory or based on in literature review. You just pick certain factors and use it to analyze. Okay. So let me just give an example. Somebody can say that in, 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 in entrepreneurship, you have got consumer, end user entrepreneurship, and you have got professional, uh, professional user entrepreneurship. Professional user are uh, the ones who have commercialized the activities that they have, what they have developed. And then end user entrepreneurs are those who are using it for their own personal gain. So they have not commercialized it. So those are two categories that I can use to be able to bring entrepreneurs together. I can bring, I need to categorize them. So we call it category based approaches. It's not based on any in depth structure, it's just based on two categories that I can see. Okay. Then you have others that we call concept based approaches. So you saw brand life is a concept. Information poverty is a concept. Um, I just discussed one right um, earlier on one of the papers. Um, oh, okay, brand, life, brand forgiveness is a concept. Now, these concepts can be used to be able to explain the phenomena. So because we are used as a principle for explaining, we can say they are concept-based approaches. Sometimes people do their work based on best concept. Just fix a concept and use to understand something. So, information poverty is a concept. Then there's something called the ripple effect. The ripple effect concept is when you drop a, a stone in a, a, a water or a river, it creates ripples, and it as it goes on, the ripples are stronger in the as closer to the to where the stone the intervention is on the stone fell, and as it goes and it becomes bigger, its effect is 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 minimal, but it can have an effect at a very at a very a, a light effect, but at a very further point. So somebody can say that uh, something has happened in the community A, but then it has a ripple effect on, on community Q, which is about uh, 100 kilometers far away from community A because of specific things that could, could happen. It's like the coronavirus, it actually hit Accra and then all the other towns that you are seeing, all the other regions are having ripple effects of it. So the further you are, you can have ripple effect. If only your borders are very close and then nobody's coming, it's just a ripple effect. So only one person travels there to control, that just trigger an issue. So we can, there's what you call the ripple effect uh, uh, concept that people use to explain interventions. But that is also at a lower level of what we call a theory. 
Then you have got model-based approaches. I'm coming, please. Model-based approaches are applied, but without um, a reference to deeper body of knowledge. So this one, you see practitioners doing that a lot. You go to a bank. They say there are two models you are using in the banking. Branch-based banking and then um, branchless banking. The branch-based banking, you have to come into the bank. In the branchless banking, you have to go outside. You can do it online. So you see those models are used by a lot of practitioners a lot. Okay. And um, then, you, 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 then there's also a framework-based approach. A framework-based approach means that the person reads the literature and then uses it to derive a framework. So he reads the different literature and then the, the postulated framework or the resulting framework is based on the literature he has read. Then the last one is a theory-based approach. The person uses a clearly identifiable theory so that you can see. Now let me show you the differences in actual papers. This is now, I've not touched this particular way before. So, this is this thing you see here, this paper on Bangland, is purely a theory based approach. Look at it, you can see the theory is out there. They told you it's based on the theory. So, it's a theory based approach. And even in this beginning, it says that the title even tells using brand, using theory of plant behavior to understand brand love. And then it tells you that the purpose of this study is to apply the theory of brand, plant behavior. So this is a theory-based approach, a theory-based approach. Now look at the framework-based approach. Now this paper that you are reading here, okay. This paper you are reading here is a combination of the resource-based theory. No, no, this is, signaling theory, and then um, the concepts from online relationship marketing. So that those are used to delineate this particular one, but this is a framework-based approach. The factors are selected. Signaling theory has not got anything called engagement interactivity. The signaling theory used here is just telling you how engagement communicates signals to lead to trust. Uh, interactively communicates signals to lead to online trust. Online trust communicates signals to lead to uh, consumer loyalty. So here you have used both the concepts in online relationship marketing and the theory. So this is a, a framework-based approach. So that is based on the review of the literature and the concepts are applied together. But the other one, the two brand behavior, it is actually stated, the guy stated that it is purely based on this one. This one is arguably, you see here you can see the element, the, the schematic diagram. The reason why I'm saying that the brand lab one is purely based on, so you can see the schematic data and the concepts from the theory in it. Attitude, subjective norm, passive behavior control are all coming from the theory of plant behavior. This one here, their engagement and relationship interactivity are all items, items or activities from online relationship marketing. Online trust is also coming as an outcome from online relationship marketing. Customer loyalty is an outcome of online relationship marketing. But the relationship, the logic between them is, is, is what the theory of plan behavior is doing, uh, 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 signal nature is doing. Signal nature is just explaining the relationship, the proposition between them. But the constructs do not belong to signal nature. So it's a framework-based approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very happy of what I'm teaching you because I'm myself, I'm understanding it better. Now, then you have the concept-based approach, the other one, the model-based approach, and then the, let me go back to my, my I've got a model-based approach, and then you have got the, um, okay, let me see. So you have got a model-based approach. Okay, so this ones I use without a deeper body of knowledge. Now let me show you this one. Okay. Um, now look at this one. Okay, so this is a model-based approach. 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 Okay, look at this. Now this is a framework-based approach. If you look at it entirely, we have read the literature and development, but within it, this is what a model-based approach looks at. If I was studying impact alone, I use incremental, transformational production. If you read it, it says, I look at it, what it says here. Look at it here. 
from the mobiles for development perspective, mobiles have been conceptualized to have three effects, a incremental, transformational, and production. That is all from these two papers, and he's using it. So here, I'm using a model-based approach to explain. Look at what, what does a model-based approach explain. A model-based approach is without reference to deeper body of knowledge. Just a few papers that somebody just mentioned and came up with this thing, so you are using it. So it's a model-based approach, and the model is saying that to look at the impact of mobiles, you can get three types of impact. You can have the incremental impact, the transformation impact, and the production impact. That is all. So it's just a model that I'm picking there to use. But a framework comes from a lot of reading there. So if I'll just study impact, I could have used the model there. Then you have a concept-based approaches. Concept-based approaches come from an actual concept that exists, like information property is a concept, and that's what you're using for your work. And you're not having any, and out of it, you try to derive theories from there. Or category-based approach, which I mentioned earlier. Now, the reason why you have a confusion now is that you are hearing words like technology acceptance model. And you are also hearing a hierarchy of effects theory. Then you are hearing something called a Porter's five forces model. Okay. What happens is that there is time in the usage of a theory. The time Porter postulated the five forces model, he gave it us within without reference to a deeper body of knowledge and started doing research on it. And as we said, gained it, it gained understanding and acceptance. It became accepted as this is the five forces model. The forces come together and he tried to explain them. But after it has been accepted, it has not been upgraded in terms of its name into a theory. So it is coming from the first name that he gave to it, Porter's five forces model. And that is the first name he gave to it. And he has not changed that. Term. So the name, it's referencing how it was started. The same as the technology acceptance model. Why is it not called the technology acceptance theory? It's called the technology acceptance model because when Davis formulated it, he formulated as a model. These loose concepts coming together to be able to predict this without a reference to a deeper body of knowledge. But as the theory, that, that, that it's not a theory, as it was being used on and on and on and on, it, the name has remained the same. So sometimes somebody may be labeled model because, but check the year it was formulated. And check the depth of theorization. What I mean by depth of theorization is that check, does it have a construct? Does it have proposition? Does it have boundary conditions? Does it have a logic? When you see all of these being there, then it is moving towards a theory. But when it's at the shallow end, then some of the things may be there, some of the things may not be there. Or itself is not being built. Or it has been accepted perfectly. Now everybody's using it as a theory. But nobody is going back to look at where it began from. So the name has become to stay. It is like <clears throat> you being called, let, let me just give you an example. When I was in prison, I was called Cosmo. Cosmo means that he, he, he mows the course. Now, at the time I got to um, my third year of Presec, a lot of people were still calling Cosmo, Cosmo. But when we left, when we left to um, uh, KNUST, only Presecans who meet me and call me Cosmo. But even KNUST, I was meeting people from this, this other college and every place. And I, did, I started doing other things on campus. So my name was not associated with the old name that of Cosmo. So people rather were referring to me as Richard, 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 and I was more into computers at that time. So now it's more, it's more about the guy who does things on computers from computers. Because in the beginning, my name was Cosmo from a particular setting. However, if I continue to propagate the name Cosmo, I could have come to this level and still when people meet me, they call me, call me Cosmo because that name, I kept that name and kept on going. But I redefined myself and I had different names as to go on. However, now that I'm a professor, if you look at the name of me being a professor, somebody will say that Cosmo is my um, anecdotal name or is my, um, um, okay, my pet name or my friendly name coming from the, what people could see, what I could become when I was in present. So sometimes somebody, you may see a paper that may call a model, something a model. Then five years later, you see the same thing now being called a theory. Because at, at a level, at a different level, more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge has come. So people are now referring this same thing as a theory <coughs> instead of calling it a model. So please, sometimes the names have to do with the growth that thing has gone through. 
either people, if, if either the author kept the name as the same name, or the author moved it from one name to another name, or <clears throat> the thing is called a model because it's not having all the dimensions of a theory. It's not all having all the dimensions of a theory. But if you see it in the beginning of somebody's work, just before the methodology, it's mostly because it's a conceptual, conceptual model at this stage going to be applied to, um, going to be applied to data collection, like I showed you earlier. So please know the levels. I'm just trying to use your So when you say a theory, a theory is the highest place. But a theoretical, a research framework is coming lower. It's coming, dropping down because now you're taking the theory and trying to apply it to a given work. Good. However, sometimes somebody can come up with something he calls a model because it's based on what he, the, he has pulled from different papers to be able to postulate something. So if you look at this particular one, let's go back to um, So here I chose to call it conceptual framework. Well, here, look at it. He's calling research model. He's not calling, which is based on the theoretical framework, the theory of plant behavior. But you see, the theory of plant behavior has been applied to brand lab. So by the time he finishes, he has now been able to develop, listen carefully, the theory of uh, 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 um, plant behavior in relation to forgiveness or in relation to brand lab. But because he doesn't want to give it a label, he just calls it the research model. What is the model for carrying out the research? So they, they are based on um, some literature review and that has put together and he has used it here. So this one, somebody can also call it a research framework. There's nothing wrong about it. The namings are very fluid. It's all dependent on what the author is trying to portray. The namings are very fluid. So don't see one name and use it to apply to another name. Okay, now I'm coming to answer your questions. But before that, let me just go back and show a little bit of something here. Um, okay. Let me just show a little bit of something here. Okay, okay. <clears throat> you see, look at service quality is now seen self qual model. The model has what? <clears throat> it's not called a self qual theory. It has been kept like that. But it was a multi skill um, 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 item, um, a multi item skill which was developed to just measure. Okay, now look at this one. hierarchy of effects theory. So he is calling it a theory. Okay. And then you have got, I just wanted to look at this one. Look at this one here. Habitat pricing theory, rational choice theory, prospect theory, cumulative prospect theory, but Monte Carlo option model, binomial options pricing model. Okay. Gordon model. Okay. So the name may stay, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be used for theorization. Legal origins theory. And I want to show you a very more confusing one. You see this one here. Resource-based view of the firm. That's what we call the resource-based theory. It's the same thing. Some people also say the resource-based model of a firm. It's all about technologies, but now it is called a resource RBT, the resource-based theory. Some people call it the resource-based view. Is using is seeing the the firm in the view of, of of resources, or is then somebody say the resource based theory, but all is coming from Bunny's work that he did on the resource based theory. Thank you very much. Oh, let me see this one. Okay, <laughs> are you looking for the 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 the, 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 the mini of course? Okay. Which of these models will be more appropriate for our level? <laughs> okay, please. We are all going for theories. You see, we all start from theories and then we bring them level to a, bring them down to a level of a framework. That's all. But I'm, what I'm just trying to say that you may go and find something a theory which is called a model. Don't be worried about ah, why is it called a model? Why is it called a theory? It's all about the conceptualization, the naming the person gave to it. Don't be get confused about it. You may have a person's theory with the name model in it. It's still a theory. The level of which you are going to apply it. So let's share. That's what I'm just trying to emphasize here. Okay. So thank you very much. How do you state or introduce your theory or consider in the 
review in your literature review. Oh, Gordon, this question, are you, I'm, I'm Felix, I'm rounding up. I'm rounding up. Okay. Um, you're asking this question, how do I, I, I have, you, have you been with us? Because that's what we have been doing throughout. If you look at it, I was showing you, look at this paper like this. Okay. Brown lab, the concept came, the another concept came, then he introduced the theory, then he looked at how the theory can be linked to the to Brown lab. That's what you do. If you look at existing long essays, you can even see how students do it. Let me see if I can find one existing long essay for you. If you look at how the students do it, you can appreciate it in that perspective. So look at this paper coming from this thesis by Nanaya. The thesis is the, de the deployment, of, deployment of mobile banking in technology in Ghanaian banks, case of Stambic Bank, okay. So let's look at the table of contents. Look at how it is, you said you wanted to know. Look at how it is started. Literature review, introduction, technology deployment and organization, Mo mobile banking technology, mobile banking service and categories. Review of mobile banking technology studies. Technology adoption frameworks. Okay, sorry, review methods of studying mobile banking. Technology deployment and adoption studies. Chair of reason action. Porter's 546 model framework. You see, he's called, people qualify 546 model. He's calling for framework. Distribution of innovation theory. Technology as organization and environment model. Okay. Research framework. He is going to use the technology organization and environmental framework. Now you call it model earlier, now it's called framework. Okay, so she chose one of them. She, she, she reviewed about four of them and chose one of them. That's what she did. So if you wanted to know how to present it, that's what she, she did in her work. So this is, okay, this research problem. So this is, oh. okay, theory of reason action, Positive hypothesis model, diffusion innovation, technology organization and environmental model. You see, the Tako Tanoski Tano, Tano, and then Flesher develop a technology organization for, um, framework that describes, look at the word he put the model here, that describes how technology innovation adopts, adoption occurs at the same level. The framework suggests that there are three elements. See, that's the words may be used. So look at it. This is the framework, external, organizational, and technology. And then technology innovation decision making. Then she applied it to her work, research framework. You see now, technology organization, environmental framework. Okay, so listen very carefully. The technology organization, um, um, environment, technology organization, environment, research framework was the main theoretical framework for this issue. So he's developing it, he's seen as a theoretical framework. He's taking it as a theory to use in the work. The, th the framework is a general theory. The framework is a general theory. The word theory is a, a general means of explaining things. That's what he's using. The framework suggests three elements. Then she applied it to her work. She applied it to her work. So when she finished, she chose the variables she wanted to study. So this is what she ended up saying. Now this is what she's going to, this is now the conceptual framework built upon using the theory, the, 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 the technology, organization framework. So in technology, she's checking, she'll be looking, asking questions on relative advantage, that's perceived usefulness and complexity. In organization, she'll be checking the size and management support. In environmental, she'll look at competitive pressure and consumer expectation. This is what she's going to use to study mobile banking. That's all she's telling you. That's all she's telling you. Then she'll justify why she uses ones. And she summarizes. Go to chapter three, research methodology. If you want this one, I can also share it with you guys. Okay, so that is all that in a nutshell we wanted to learn today. Thank you very much. It has been a longer session today, but it's also because of the fact that this is a, a pure three hour session that we have been able to do. But what the objective was to try and understand a very, an area which is very complex in nature. And some authors, some students even find it more difficult to appreciate what, um, to understand it very well. But we have been able to do justice with that. We thank. Um, God for helping us to be able to understand these things in a good way and we can apply it. The video will be made available hopefully by tomorrow evening so that, or by Monday morning so that I can have it to watch.